29. Okay, members, you're all very welcome to the meeting this morning and apologies for the late start. I got caught up in um, some roadworks this morning. So I'm going to move then. Oh, sorry, first of all, before I start, I'll just let you know that in the room with myself today, I have Robin Newton and Andy Allen. And on Starleaf, we have <coughs> Kelly Armstrong, the Vice Chair, Alex Eason and Karen Mullen. Um, I'll move on then to agenda item one, which is apologies. I've received an apology from Sinead and Fra this morning. Um, I don't think there's, I think everybody, oh, Mark's not here yet, but I haven't received anything back from Mark, but he may well be joining us. Okay, members, I'll then move on to agenda item two, which is chairperson's business. Um, members, on Tuesday evening, um, engagement in the education service facilitated a very successful young person Zoom event for us on the licensing bill. Janice and Antoinette were involved from the committee team and a number of members were in attendance and we all found it very useful. Um, I know that certainly Kelly was there, Andy was there and Karen and myself. Um, it certainly was very useful. Um, some of the views the young people gave um, were, were rather enlightening um, around the bill and actually thought of many things that we didn't think of, so it was really worthwhile. Just say that the young people in attendance were put forward by the Northern Ireland Football Association, Nikki, Antrim Brammer, a hockey society, a dance academy, Girl Guiding, Cooperation Ireland, Youth Action and Voipic. Um, just to let you know that notes of the event will be circulated to all members as soon as possible. Okay, members, I'll move on then to agenda item three, which is the draft minutes. You'll find the draft minutes um, for the 4th of March 2021 at page six of your meeting pack. Can I ask members, are you content to agree the minutes of the 4th of March 2021 as drafted? Content. Thank you. Okay, then we'll move to agenda item four, which is matters arising. Um, members, you've been provided at page 18 with the latest report from the Examiner of Statutory Rules. The Examiner draws attention to ASR 2021-45, the COVID-19 Heating Payment Scheme Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. The Department has acknowledged that the regulations were laid in breach of the 21-day rule and have explained the reason for the breach. The Examiner is content that the Department has provided a satisfactory reason for the breach. Can I ask members, have they any comments? Are they content to note? Content to note. Thank you. Note. I'll move on then. Uh, members, you've been provided at page 26 with the departmental response in the review of charity regulation. The department states that it appears that the original correspondent might have conflated the independent review of charity regulation commis commissioned by Minister Nicolin and the review commissioned by the Chief Commissioner of the Charity Commission for Northern Ireland to be conducted by independent counsel. This may explain some of the commentary in respect of the apparent lack of departmental involvement. Again, can I ask members, have they any comment on that? Are they content to note? Content to note. Content to note, okay. Then can I ask members, move to page 28 of their pack, um, where we have a response um, from the department on the renewal of the PIP contract. DWP intends to extend its existing contracts for PIP and work capability assessment by two years from August 21 to July 23. In relation to the second independent review of PIP by Mary Kavanagh, the department is carefully considering the recommendations. Again, can I ask members of the any comments or the content to note that also? Content to note. Okay, thank you. Then can I ask you to go to page 29 of your meeting pack where you see a departmental response on the draft programme for government. The Minister is keen that the PFG affords the maximum possible priority to housing and has raised with the executive that there should be a specific housing outcome and will continue to support this commitment post consultation. Members, any comment? Kelly, do you have your hand up? Okay. I was just going to say, Chair, um, your microphone's cutting out quite a bit. Um, I don't know if there's other noise there, but um, yeah, I absolutely agree. New decade, new approach um, had agreed and there was cross-party political agreement for a second outcome. And I can say that, that the department are looking, um, you know, they, they've referenced, you know, the other outcomes. Um, but to be honest, it's, it's such an important issue. It does need to have a separate outcome. And that's what the negotiations had agreed. Um, I know that the consultation is ongoing, but the fact is that the consultation has gone out without that separate housing outcome, which is quite disappointing. Um, so I just wondered if we could maybe ask the department why the consultation went out um, without that outcome included. Okay, I can certainly do that. Any other comment or members agreed with Kelly's proposal? Great. 
Great. Thank you. Okay, we'll do that. Um, then, if members happy enough, then that I move on. And I think, let me see where I am. Okay, yep, yep. page 31 of your meeting pack. Um, there's a departmental, departmental response on the discretionary support fund and help with health costs. Information about the <coughs> contingency fund grant is provided to everyone making a claim through a welcome message on their online journal account. People are advised of the contingency fund grant before any reference is made to the advance payment option. The grant is also promoted through the department's social media accounts on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. An additional targeted promotional activity is planned to commence this month. Universal credit here is delivered through DWP computer system. Therefore, it isn't possible to include the facility to apply for the contingency fund, which is unique to Northern Ireland and administered through a separate standalone discretionary com support computer system. A link to the criteria and regulations for discretionary support is included in the reply. Help with health and travel costs is about available through the Health Services Low Income Scheme. The department does not report on the numbers of people applying for help with health and travel costs as it, did, as it does not administer the scheme. A review of the policy and operational delivery of discretionary support is planned and the department will consider earnings limit in undertaking this review. Kelly, you have wanted to Comments. Yes, um, I'm, I'm very keen, as are all of us, you know, we, we've already seen the, the report that has come out about the disability strategy. Um, <sighs> I know that they're saying that DWP manage the computer system, therefore you can't apply directly through um, you know, the, the program that people link into, but I would like to ask the department if an easy read version is available, because this is complicated enough without anyone with um, reading difficulties um, having to pour through the complexity of the documentation. So I just want to know, is there an easy read version available? And as we heard um, last week from the deaf community, um, English is not always someone's first language. Um, are there alternative translation options available? I'm sure there are for lots of languages, but it's just to make sure that there are all fully inclusive alternative translation options available for people to explain how to apply to the contingency fund, given the fact that it's not in, in the person can't get to it, you know, when they're applying for universal credit. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Andy? Yeah, Chair, sure. just, just building on Kelly's point, um, as I understand it, the Department have the scope delays with DWP to put forward amendments to the computer system. Now, I don't know if we could get a bespoke amendment in this respect, but can we maybe check with the Department to see if they have had discussion with DWP to see if this would be possible to create the provision to apply for the contingency fund in can respect we, of Northern Ireland? Yeah, certainly we can, we can ask um, both of those questions. I do know from sitting uh, here doing the Welfare Reform Bill that any changes to the system were at a cost to Northern Ireland. Um, so there yeah. is a cost factor there as well, but we can ask that with the question. Um, um, would it be a cost to Northern Ireland or would DWP? You pay, pick up the cost on it. Um, so I think that's mm -hmm. worth asking too. Members content then with with those suggestions? Yes. We move on. Okay. Um, members, then can I ask you to turn to page 33 of your pack, where there's a departmental response. I can't say that word this morning. On COVID-19 heating payment appeals funding, in situations where an individual has a pending application or appeal which is successful in the next financial year, the department is making arrangements to accrue funding in 2020-21 to cover such circumstances in 21-22. And I think that's the question that Kelly that you had asked them at the time. Just to ask members, are they content with that? Content to note that? Or any comment? Content? Good. Content. Yes. Thank you. Okay, then we'll move on and could you turn to page 34? Again, there's a departmental response on the COVID-19 Culture, Languages, Arts and Heritage Fund. All eligible applicants to this fund have now been awarded grant funding. Letters of offer, of offer were issued to 1,562 individuals on the 24th of February 2021 for awards totalling 6.9 million. So I just want to say this is very welcome news. I know of, of a few groups that have contacted me to say that they have received their, their funding. So uh, just well done on that. Members, any comment or content to note that? Content? Content to note, yeah. Good stuff. 
Um, then can I ask you to turn to page 35, where um, departmental correspondence on the social inclusion strategies expert panel reports, and this starts at page 35. Um, work has commenced via the strategies co-design groups and cross-departmental working groups to analyse the deliverability of the recommendations and examine how they can inform the development of the st strategies and their supporting action plans. The Minister and departmental officials will continue to liaise with the Committee as work on the development of each of these strategies progresses. Members, the extensive report on the expert panel panels have been provided in your pack for your information. Just to say, I don't think there's any scope within our meeting today to go into this in great detail. Um, but I think that once we've completed our licensing bill, this is something that we certainly want um, to, to explore further. Would members agree with that rather than get into a debate around it now? Yeah? Absolutely, yes. Good stuff. Okay. Yeah. All right, members, what we're going to do now is we're going to move uh, from agenda four, um, item four to agenda item six, as agenda item five is the licensing bill deliberations. So what I'm suggesting is we complete all of our normal weekly business first, right to the very end, and then we'll come back then to the licensing bill, and that allows us to continue until probably about one o'clock, and then we'll wash up then. So uh, members' agreement, we'll move to agenda item six then, which is SL1, the Occupational and Personal Pension Schemes General Levy Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. A copy of the SL1 is at page 748 of your meeting pack. The proposed rule gives effect to new rates that will be used to, or to calculate the general levy payable by occupational pension schemes and personal pension schemes. Can I ask our members' content for the department to proceed to make this rule? Sorry. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay, members, then we'll turn to tabled papers, um, and you'll find the SL1, the Social Security Claims and Payments Telephone and Video Assessment Regulations. The proposed regulations will expand the channels for medical examination and consultation in addition to those methods currently used by DFC. The amendments in these regulations will enable medical examinations examinations and consultations to be conducted in person by telephone or by video where required as part of the process for determining uh, entitlement to um, various uh, benefits. This will enable DFC to tailor the assessments to meet the needs of different claimants and help to ensure the most appropriate method is used. Members, any comment on that? Are they happy then for the department to proceed to make the rule? Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, I was just going to say it follows up on my previous comment about accessibility. Um, it's not for changing what's being proposed here, but when they talk about video, I would be quite keen to ensure that VRS is available um, and that they have a. Con I think they, there is a contract in place, but um, for instance, the current video provision, which isn't VRS, I believe has no subtitles. Um, I, I just there, there's other clarification questions about how someone can be accompanied in those um, sessions that needs clarification. But at this stage, I just would be quite keen to ensure that where they talk about video, that that's inclusive, as we heard last week and we saw last week, the difficulties that people can have um, when you add into that other um, disabilities, um, in particular learning disabilities, it's vital that, that the communications, and I very much welcome the breadth and the, the wealth of communications that are being provided, but they must be fully inclusive. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, and I think it's very timely after our, our meeting last week with the deaf community. So uh, it would be then, if, if uh, members are agreed, this is the SL1, so could we ask then for them to come back with further information on that next week before we agree to the department making the rule? Members agreed with that, yeah? Agreed. Okay. Sure, just as well. Sorry, go ahead. Just, I'm sure, well, a consideration will be built in, but just to make sure that uh, no individual who doesn't feel able to participate in uh, a video based um, medical assessment won't have that held against them and they can wait for a face to face assessment if they feel that's the most appropriate uh, consultation for them. Okay, I think then we need to get just a little bit more information on this um, before we agree to it. No, they're all good points. Okay, members, then we'll move on then to agenda item seven, which is SR 2021-48, Guaranteed Minimum Pensions Increase Order, Northern Ireland 2021. You'll find a copy of this rule at 753, your meeting pack. Can I then just ask if members have any objections to the rule? No. 
Okay. Then I'll put the following that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-48, the Guaranteed Minimum Pensions Increase Order, Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the Examiner's Statute Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Okay, members, we'll move on then. Oh, goodness, here's the word that I find really difficult to say. To table papers, uh, SR 2021-55, the new moconiosis, etc., workers' compensation payment of claimants' conditions and amounts, amendment regulations, Northern Ireland. Again, can I ask members, have they any objections to this rule? No. Okay, thank you. Then I'll put the following that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2021-55, the pneumoconiosis, etc., workers' compensation payment um, of claims, conditions and amounts, amendment regulations, Northern Ireland, and recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly. Okay, members, we're going to move on to agenda item 8, which is correspondence. Members, you'll find the me memo at page 760 of your meeting pack. Can I draw your attention just, I think, to two items? The first one is at page 1111 which is a request by Hospitality Ulster to brief us on its post-COVID recovery plan. Members, as you know, the priority at present is to conclude committee stage of the licensing bill. But if you're content that we receive that briefing once the bill is concluded? Yes. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then members at page 1112 uh, is a request from co-ownership to meet with me as chair to discuss the department's housing policy. Are members content that I meet the organisation and bring back a note to the, the for a future committee meeting? Agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Okay, members, yeah. thank you. Can I ask then, it's, does anyone have anything else to bring up under correspondence, Kelly? Thank you, Chair. It just may be me, but um, can I ask under the first um, tabled paper from the Department of Communities, um, which is the Department of Finance Springs Supplementary Estimates, I don't have the attachment um, for that document. Um, if maybe those that supplementary estimates can be forwarded. Okay, we'll ensure that's done. That's not a problem. Okay, and uh, any other members, if they require it, um, Andy, did you want to come in? I just want to come back to the hospitality uh, point, if we can, chair. After this. Okay. No, well, that's okay. We've finished that one. Go ahead, Andy. Sure, just just on this hospitality one, and obviously as we move for th through the. Uh, the executive's plan in terms of reopening in our economy. If we can maybe right back to Hospitality Ulster and better understand the lead-in time. Um, I have met with Hospitality Ulster as an individual MLA, and I would like to better understand, you know, how their members, uh, what what sort of notice they will need from the executive to be able to reopen, because obviously. A lot of these uh, premises have been closed for a considerable period of time uh, and they're going to need uh, as much notice as they possibly can to, to reopen, to get their staff back in, many of them who have been on furlough, to get stock in. As we point back to previous uh, examples whereby you know, we maybe had a week's notice or a couple of days notice to try and reopen and I don't think that's, that's okay. a factor for them. No, good point. We we can ask them to send us through that information, and then we can we can um, send that information on in support of them. Um, Kelly, did you have something you want to bring up? Yeah, I was just going to um, come back to what Andy has said there. Um, I know that co-ownership have provided us with a written briefing, which is great because we have the opportunity to read through that. But as Andy has said, um, you know, obviously Hospitality Ulster have quite a lot of details already mapped out and they want to present that to us. It would be very useful if they could provide a written um, report to us um, because we won't get to this until after Easter. And hopefully by then we may see some movement from the executive on um, movements down the path way to recovery um, it would be useful perhaps if we could ask Hospitality Ulster if they have anything in writing to, to forward that to us so we can review that. Yep yeah, okay that's fair enough good point. Members any other issues under correspondence they want to highlight are they happy enough with the memo? Yep. Yeah. Okay mm -hmm. that's good. I'll then move on to agenda item nine which is our forward work program. Just to inform members that at the meeting on the 18th of March 2021, the committee will continue its deliberations on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Members content with that? Yes. Okay. Agenda item 10, I'm moving to AOB already. Is there any other business at this stage? There might be at the end of the meeting, but at this stage, is there any other business? No, okay. And then I'm going to move to item, agenda item 14, which is date, time, location of next meeting. And just to advise members that our next meeting will take place um, next Thursday, the 18th of March, 2021, here in room 29 at 9.15 a.m. Okay, um, normally at that stage, we all say cheerio, but I'm afraid that's not going to happen. <laughs> 
We're going to move then on to agenda item five, which is committee deliberations on the clauses of the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, members, the committee will now commence its deliberations um, uh, on, on this bill on a subject matter basis as agreed, what we agreed last week. Members, you've been provided with papers for this item starting at page 536 with a copy of the bill. Members have also been provided with a response from the Wine and, Tr and Spirit Trade Association at 580 and summaries of stakeholder evidence documented or documents numbered 1 to 8 starting at page 583. It will all become crystal clear as we go along. Um, we have Carol Reid and Liam Quinn from the department who are in attendance and Claire McCanny from the Bill Office is following proceedings and will be available to the committee for a closed session at the end of the meeting should members wish to discuss options for amendments and instruction for drafting committee amendments. Um, can I just remind members that this is not the formal clause by clause stage. This is our deliberations and our chance to speak to the department. Um, members, for the next few weeks, we'll have the opportunity to go through the clause and comprehensively review with the department any key issues raised by stakeholders or committee members and to ask for clarification on how the bill addresses these concerns and any additional action um, that the department intends to take on the back of the evidence the committee has received. In addition to the clauses that are in the bill, we received evidence on additional measures and various organisations and individuals propose, propose that should be in the bill and they are summarised in document 8 of your pack. However, I propose we leave the consideration of those additional measures. That's the likes of the cinemas and things like that. There were additional that weren't in this. Can we leave that until we have worked through all existing clauses? except where, this measure, where the measure is directly re related to those issues that have been brought up. Are members in agreement that, that we progress that way as well? Yes? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, members, just before we start, I just want to say I'm going to leave everybody in the spotlight, so I am, rather than have people having to, um, and me missing hands being put up and everything else. So I'm leaving everybody in the spotlight. Um, this is deliberation, so it's more of a discussion. Um, so it is. I think I, if you can uh, let me know that I asked the clerk yesterday to send you everybody in uh, on uh, all of our members through my briefings that notes that I have in front of me, so that you are easy to follow what the the, um, the different things that I'm saying. The department also have those notes, and as does Claire. Um, so it's just for clarification. Um, so members, this is going to be pretty long. So bear with us. And uh, we'll see how we get on. If there's too much noise and too much background noise, I will put you all out of the spotlight. So just remember, we can hear everything that's going on <laughs> and where you are as well. So we're going to start a turn to the first set of clauses. And in that case, members, the first set of clauses we will consider are those related to permitted hours for licensed premises and registered clubs. That is clauses one, two, four, five. 7, 23 and 24. The summary of evidence we have received on these clauses can be found in document 1, starting at page 583. If, our mem if members are minded um, to propose amendments as we proceed through the clauses, these can be discussed with the bill clerk in our closed session at the end of our deliberations. <laughs> with a view bringing back wording of the amendments to the meeting next week. Can I remind members that questions or comments should be focused on the specific clause that we're discussing at any one time? And if our members are content, we'll start then. And can I welcome and can we bring into the spotlight Liam Quinn and Carol Reid? Morning, Chair. Good morning. Morning, Chair. Morning. Um, I think then, Carl, I will ask you to give a very brief overview of each clause. Then I will quickly highlight any specific issue that has come up in our evidence of that clause before I ask members if they have any queries or comments on the clause. So we're going to go first of all then to clause 1 and 23. Carl, can you please give an overview um, on these clauses on the removal of additional restrictions at Easter? Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, cer certainly, Chair. Thank you. Um, and as you rightly said, there are an awful lot, and I've been asked to give a very brief overview. Um, so rather than getting into policy intent, I'll just stick with what the actual clauses do in the bill. So clause one is for licensed premises, obviously, and clause 23 is the same for registered clubs. Um, it removes... Can you hear me okay, sorry? Yes, we can hear you, Carl. Yes, sorry. Um, 
it removes all current restrictions that are in place over the Easter weekend. So effectively, permitted hours will be the same over the Easter weekend as any other weekend throughout the year. Just quite a short close. Okay. <coughs> um, okay, members. Uh, in our evidence, there was considerable support for this modernisation of this licensing law by removing restrictions at Easter. However, there was also a number of concerns raised regarding protecting the rights of workers over the Easter period and other religious festivals of significance. There was monetary, the concern around monetary compensation for working these hours over Easter and the public health message against expanding any permitted hours on the basis that increased uh, accessibility further encourages alcohol consumption although we will likely discuss that more in clause two. So can I ask then, members, have you any comments or questions you want to ask the department around this clause? Go ahead, Kelly. Um, it was just on that point about um, the welfare of employees. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that that would be completely outside of, of this um, legislation, or does the department think that there is um, scope to add it in as a requirement in the legislation for issuing of licence that there's consideration for staff? Chair, maybe I can take that one. Um, okay. I'm on, on the phone here, Chair. I've had IT problems this morning, so I hope you can hear me. can hear you yeah. okay, Liam. Go ahead. Great. Um, you know, issues around extra pay and uh, protection and getting staff home at night, no, they're, they're all very important. But as, as Kelly sort of highlights, I, I do believe they're probably outside the scope of this bill. Although, of course, um, decisions around the scope of a bill will fall to uh, the Speaker. And the other issue around holidays and, and uh, the uh, option to opt out. Um, there's already an opt-out for, for Sunday, for working on Sundays, and of course um, bars are currently open on Easter Sunday, uh, same as they are every other Sunday. The, the, the issue around Easter Sunday is that they have to close earlier um, than they do on other Sundays. And Good Friday, protections for Good Friday, uh, Good Friday isn't a bank holiday. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how uh, that would be handled, but again, I strongly suspect that it would be outside the scope of this bill. Okay, thanks, Liam. Member Kelly, do you want to come back? Or members, or any other member have any comments they want to make on clause um, one and twenty-three? If I could just double double check, just um, thanks very much for letting us know about that option to opt out. It just prompted me um, the current legislation about opting out that will extend to this bill. We don't have to put anything else into that. That's that's already in place. I know it was in place um, with regards to shops do, or retail. Is it is it under retail? I think it's it's referred to. But does that extend then to pubs and hotels? Um, that, that is, it is retail, um, Kelly. You're absolutely right. Um, I'll, I'll have to check that it extends to, to pubs. But, but uh, I, I do imagine that anyone who had strong uh, religious beliefs, you know, Simply wouldn't work on a on a Sunday, uh, in in a pub in particular. And uh, you know, we we haven't nobody ever brought to our attention instances where people were being forced to work in in pubs um, on a Sunday uh, against their strongly held religious beliefs. But I mean, I can check that point and we can write back to you. It's Department for Economy legislation, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was just wondering when you said there about um, people wouldn't have come to yourselves. It may well be the Labour Relations Agency or some of the HR um, side of, of legislation and, of course, economy. But I'm just if, if we have I don't know whether we need to ask economy if, if their opt out relating to retail needs to be extended or not, that would be really useful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other members want to make any comment around that? Are they happy enough with... Oh, sorry, Alex, your hand up. Can't hear you, Alex. You on silent? Can you, yeah, can can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, th 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 this doesn't relate to the, the pubs opening up for the extra hours, does it? It's, it's just Yo, off licence. This is yeah. the... The, the removal of the restrictions around Easter only that we're look, we're talking about at the moment. Okay. But is that's okay. we'll talk about that as we go along, Alex. Okay, thank you. Only. 
Okay, members, any other comment on that? Um, are content with uh, the responses we received and we'll get further clarification as to whether the, the, the Sunday opening or sun, having to work on a Sunday um, goes into the, the service industry as well as retail? I suppose that's what we want to know. Yeah. Okay. Can I just ask as well, Chair, um, with, the, with the additional hours, as we know, and, and it has been mentioned there, you're absolutely right, Good Friday is not a, a, a statutory holiday. But I'm just thinking, the way that our transport works in Northern Ireland, um, Easter weekend has a reduced service. Um, has there been any comment at all to the department from TransLink or DFI um, about any concerns about additional hours? Well, the additional hours over um, Easter would be that um, bars and restaurants, hotels could serve drink on a Friday afternoon um, between opening time and 5 p.m. Uh, they would also be able to open uh, later into the evening. Um, TransLink, uh, to, to answer your question directly, no, TransLink or, or the Department of Infrastructure haven't been in touch to express any concerns o over that. But the, the, the truth of the matter is, um, for late opening, very few people use public transport on their way home from, from bars or restaurants in, late in the evening. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, are we happy then we move on? Yes? Okay, we're going to move then to Clause 2. Um, so again, I think it's over to you, Carl, and this clause is around public houses and hotels and further additional hours. So go ahead, Carl. Thank you. So yeah, clause two provides that a license holder for a pub or a hotel can apply to serve drink then until 2 a.m. up to 104 times a year. The clause um, allows that number to be amendment, amended by regulations in the future. Um, it also ensures it's similar to the current 1 a.m. late opening that a court has to be satisfied that there's no undue inconvenience being caused to local residents. Um, the clause allows for objections to be made from the police, councils and local residents um, and that the courts can place conditions at that stage. And finally, the clause then allows that upon complaint, the courts could make um, modifications to an order, uh, a 2 a.m. order or revoke an order or place that order subject to certain conditions as well. Okay, thank you. Carol, okay, members, um, in our evidence there was considerable support for this modernisation of licensing laws to improve the nighttime economy and to support changes in consumer behaviour and the expectations of tourists. However, I just want to remind members then there was a number of key issues, um, a, a, a number of specific issues were raised in relation to Article 44 and 45 of the licensing order by Hospitality Ulster and the Law Centre. Issues were also raised relating to Sunday trading hours into Monday and the definition of entertainment. Also, the long-term public health impacts of increased accessibility to alcohol was highlighted as reinforcing alcohol as a social norm and increasing the risk of alcohol misuse and harms. And also then the likely re resource impacts on the PSNI and health and social care services, the safety of the hospitality workforce, and members also, the Federation of Clubs highlighted that the bill provides no provision for an increased entitlement for clubs to serve alcohol after 11 p.m. and questioned this disparity. The Federation have requested an increase from 85 nights to 156 late nights, that's three per week, in order to ensure their continued financial viability and provided uh, a suggested amendment for that. So again, members picking up on those points, do members want any clarification then, some clarification from the uh, department on those points? Liam or Carol, if you can give some clarification on any of those points would be good. Yeah, Chair, in relation to the um, Article 44 and Article 45 um, disparity that has been referenced by Hospitality Ulster and the Law Society, um, the Department had addressed that. It's, it's in the bill currently. So in Clause 4.2, um, any, any licensed premises that has an Article 44, I'm um, sorry, any pub that has an Article 44 in place already can actually go to the police up to 20 times a year and ask for that Article 45, um, which then allows them to deal with those ad hoc nights. Okay, and um, can I just ask you then also then in relation to what the Federation of Clubs have highlighted and the disparity um, that they feel that, that, that they're being treated? 
And maybe take that chair. Um, club, clubs, of course, aren't, aren't businesses, and they, they supply drink to to their members. Um, but the, the minister uh, has heard their evidence and, and would uh, consider uh, any proposals that come forward from the committee by way of extending or increasing the number of late nights that the clubs can apply to the police for. Okay, so th there there is some scope there. Then you're saying, Liam. Um, for this to, for this to be looked up by the minister, yes. Yeah, the minister will consider um, whatever comes forward from from the committee carefully. Uh, she has heard what the clubs are saying, and obviously clubs have have taken a, a serious financial hit uh, during the last year in the same way as, as businesses have. And we do know actually from some of the grant schemes, actually a lot of these clubs are treated as businesses um, because they have been re re receiving, you know, the likes of the LRS scheme and things like that. A lot of clubs have received, um, so they very much feel that they are, they should be on more of a par. Um, so no, that's okay. I, I'm happy enough with that. Um, whenever the committee come to a decision on that, when we speak maybe with Claire later. Um, any other on on that clause two? The further additional hours was that something, Alex, that you wanted? Don't know where Alex is going. Okay, yeah. sorry, Alex. No, I'm here. It was the the, the uh, further additional hours. Was it something that you wanted to bring up there? Um, does the things do, do additional hours then will that happen on Easter Day as well for pubs? That's what I'm looking at. Okay, so can they then have the additional hours on Easter Day? Um, can you answer that then, Liam or Carol? Yeah, uh, Easter uh, would be Easter Sunday would be the same as any other day. The the extra hour would be, of course, on Easter Monday. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you. So that that runs is over um, Easter Sunday into one a.m. then, or, or into um, Easter Monday. Yep. Okay. All right, uh, Kelly. Okay. Kelly, you wanted to ask questions? Yeah, uh, it's just in regards to the concerns that we received through witness sessions about the extra hours. And I'm just wondering, has the, the department made any consideration to what was talked about, which was a, like a nighttime levy for those um, pubs, well, pubs, hotels, and possibly clubs now, um, extend a night that late and the additional costs that could be felt by um, place, hospitals, health, other other places. Is there any consideration for the late night levy that's elsewhere? Well, um, Kelly, I think you know. I'm, I'm not sure this is the right time to be considering additional levies on, on the hospitality industry, given the year that they've had. Um, the the police have already indicated that, that there'll be no additional expense or cost for them, uh, provided the late nights are at weekends. Um, and built into the um, into the order is the option for the minister to uh, reduce the number of late nights uh, or restrict them if, if, if we find that they are causing difficulties for the health service, police, or, or even local communities. But uh, no, there's, there's been no serious consideration of, of a levy, and, and uh, I suspect that it, it wouldn't go down very well given the economic conditions we're in now, with a, a, an industry suffering so badly and, and about to try and come out of, of uh, probably the worst period that they've ever had. Um, to be honest, we have to set legislation that's going to last longer than the current period of time, so that's why I'm thinking ahead. Is there an option in regulations in the future then for a nighttime levy to be implemented if we find that our hospitals, you know, people have an extra hours, an extra two hours drinking time really, um, and, and we have heard witness statements through that, that there are concerns about that. If we, the police may not have any foreseeable concerns at this stage about cost, but others have stated that there will be costs. And I'm just wondering, is there the option then to put this in without having to amend primary legislation? Is there something that can be done in regulations in the future if we find as Northern Ireland that there is a, a, an expense? I think we would have to take a par on the face of the bill, which would go through primary, Kelly, uh, which would then, uh, the regulations which would follow later, would set the scale uh, of the uh, levy and where and when it may apply and who, who would have to pay it and what would happen to the funds raised. Um, I mean, there would probably need to be a discussion as well with Treasury 
because very often uh, something of this nature being raised may uh, end up being taken back to uh, Whitehall. Um, although it may be possible to do it through the rates or something. Uh, it's something that hasn't been looked at in depth, um, but we would need a, an amendment to the bill to give the department a power to impose a levy, uh, and then the, the regulations which would follow later would set out all the detail. Yeah. Okay. I just I did, from our witness statements, there didn't seem to be any indication that Treasury had an issue with it in other council areas across England. But as you say, we haven't gone into that. But if we're gonna have, if we're gonna do that, um, if there is, I don't know whether there will be an opportunity to amend to add that in, and it would need to be done now. Um, otherwise, it will be an, a, a ministerial amendment later. Then, yeah, it has yeah. to be primary. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, any other member want to make comment then on um, the clause two at this stage? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Nope. Okay. Then we're going to move on then, members, to clause four, which is police, police authorisations for additional hours. Again, Carol, can I ask you to give um, an overview on this clause? Sure. So clause four, we often refer to it as small pubs, but what we actually mean is pubs that aren't structurally adapted to be able to provide food and or entertainment um, and therefore they don't qualify for an article 44. So the police authorizations then they can apply to the police for their 1am opening. Um, that's currently sitting at 20 occasions in the year and the bill will increase that to 85. Um, clause 4 also allows pubs then, as I mentioned earlier, that have an article 44 that apply to the police for 1am opening up to 20 times a year. Um, they still need to provide food or entertainment or and or entertainment whenever they use those 20 occasions. Um, and the clause also includes a provision then that that number um, the, in respect of the 20 and the 85 can be amended by regulations then in the future. Okay, thanks, Carol. Then I'll just highlight some of the issues then of, that we had heard. And they were that it's similar to public health argument, arg uh, arguments put forward as regards any additional hours for alcohol sales and consumption. There was support by the industry for additional hours for small pubs, um, though the 85 was questioned by a number of submissions as to why it was not 104, the same as their larger premises. Um, the PSNI queried the demand for the increase from 20 to 85 nights um, on the basis that the Article 45 authorizations for additional permitted hours have not been widely used in the last number of years. And then also Drumbo Park Limited requested a specific amendment regarding places of public entertainment and outdoor stadiums being included in the category of premises and can apply for additional hours to 1am and the maximum number of authorisations being 104. You'll find this at document seven in your pack for details. Um, any comment or, or that you want to make on the on that, Liam or Carol, on those points, those four points? Well, the increase um, or the request for the increase to 85, again, Minister has listened to the evidence um, and would consider any amendment that the, the, the committee might decide in terms of what a, a suitable number above the 85 would be. Um, the Drumbo Park request, you know, places of public entertainment, they're very specific premises. You know, it's a theatre, a ballroom, a racetrack. Um, there's a question there about the, the need for there to actually be a 1am op opening for there. It hasn't been consulted on. Um, so I think there'd be more, you know, more research need done on that. Um, outdoor stadiums that was raised as well, they currently have the ability to apply for an Article 47, which would allow them to um, run a function up until 1am. Um, and they were given the Article 47, let's say, over and above the Article 44. The Article 44s have to be habitual. You know, it, ha it has to be every, sing every single week. So I don't think really it is suitable for those types of premises to have that. And the Article 47, can it be applied for as many times as they like? Are Article they 47, I, I don't believe, I don't believe there's a limit on that. Liam, can you think off the top of your head? I'm not aware of it, Carol. So the likes of Drumbo, Drumbo Park then can apply for an Article 47, can they? Not at the minute, no. Not at the minute, okay. So what way does that leave them if, if they're unable to then fall into this clause and can't apply for an Article 47 either? Well, again, I think it comes down to the, the type of premises that they are. They're a licensed racetrack. So, okay. you know, that they, they, they fit into the place of public entertainment. 
One of the, one of the basic um, principles of, of the license and order chair um, is that um, the, the two types of premises, the off sales and the pubs, are permitted to sell uh, drink. Uh, other uh, premises are allowed to sell alcohol and celery to um, other events or, or activities taking place on the premises. So a racetrack is permitted to sell drink along with uh, a race meeting. Or, or a theatre is permitted to sell drink while uh, an artistic performance is taking place. Um, so you know, one AM uh, associated with a racetrack, it, it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense because you're not going to be having racing at, at that time of night. Okay, yeah, no, that's fair enough. That's that's a good point, Liam. Um, okay, members, can I ask members if they any further questions or want to explore anything further that I've, I've said? Sure. Go ahead, Robin. Yeah, uh, so on the basis of the PSNI evidence. Um, uh, PS and I were indicating that um, the increase from 20 to 85, A, if you have ever availed of the 20 nights, PS and I questioned if there was a demand for it, and then also indicated there would be a resourcing impact if all taken up. Can I just, where, where did the 85, number 85 actually come from? What, where is that proposal? Did you sure, the, the 85 uh, came forward uh, to bring uh, the small, uh, the generally small bars into line with the, the late nights that uh, registered clubs could avail of. Okay, so bring them into line, okay. And I suppose yeah. the, the argument there as well is that not all small bars are going to use it, not all large bars are going to use them either. Um, so no. I suppose it, it, it's there as they can be used, but they're under no obligation to use them. Um, can, can I just check then, Chair, if, 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 no, <laughs> if we were to amend the clubs to 104, then that 85 should really be aligned with that? Yes, I think uh, Chair um, Minister would consider um, that option should, should the uh, committee be minded to put forward a proposal of that nature. Thank you. Okay, Liam, thank you. Any other members want to make comment then on Clause 4? Are they happy enough? They've heard enough on that from the department? Yeah? Okay. No. All right, then. We're going to move then to Clauses 5 and 24 together. Um, then, Carl, can you give an overview of, of both of these clauses um, that relate to extension of drinking up time? Yeah, certainly. So clause five, obviously, for licensed premises, <coughs> excuse me, and clause 24 for the registered clubs. So it extends the current drinking up time from 30 minutes to an hour. So basically, there's an exception in the current law. Um, so, you know, the law says that it's illegal to consume or allow consumption outside of permitted hours. The 30 minutes that's currently there is an exception to that that allows you to, to finish consumption. Um, and the extension is up until an, um, up an extra 30 minutes then. Um, the clause also includes a power to revert back to 30 minutes. In the future, should there be any issues there, obviously the issues might not show straight away, or um, it could take a little time um, to settle in. So that 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 part's already been done by regulation, so it could be done relatively quickly. Okay, thanks, Carl. I just then remind members that there was considerable support for this measure from the hospitality sector for a range of factors such as discouraging binge drinking, um, to relieve pressure on transport, and helping to reduce antisocial behaviour. However, public health related submissions generally believe that it may simply lead to more drinking time overall and therefore related um, health impacts by individuals purchasing larger quantities of alcohol at last orders, staying in the premises for longer and becoming more intoxicated. The PSNI highlighted that the majority of patrons will likely remain on the premises until the end of drinking up time and therefore it will likely lead to increased alcohol consumption with potential for increased antisocial behaviour. Um, a number of submissions supported a review of this clause to be built into the legislation. And I suppose that's where I maybe want to start by asking about that, Liam. Um, we did hear that, um, from, especially from any of the, the, the public health side, that there should definitely be a review built into this, um, should it be a year, and should we find out that after that year that um, this ha has led to more issues, whether that is uh, transport issues, police issues, 
um, hospital admissions, whatever that might be. Um, just your your views on what the minister thinks that maybe about that, about a, about the building that into the legislation review. Oh, um, well, the, the, the extra 30 minutes of, of drinking up time, uh, you know, it, it's possible it may have an adverse impact. And, and we, the ministers heard the evidence from uh, the, the health lobby and, and the health practitioners and also from police. Um, so there most certainly will be a review. Uh, whether it should be on the, the face of the bill is, is, is an issue. Um, I think the minister would prefer to have the flexibility to allow us to do the review and come back to the assembly with a report um, at a, an appropriate time. Um, I mean, if we were to, to build into the bill that we had to have a review after, say, 12 months, uh, and, and the pandemic were to continue with another lockdown in early in the new year, uh, I mean, an inflexible date like that just would not not, not work. So uh, I think uh, probably a commitment from the minister in the house to report back to uh, the assembly, saying that uh, we have looked at this and here's here's our proposals, or given a time frame for a full formal review, might be might be best. Okay, and that's understandable as well. But absolutely, we understand though from the evidence sessions we have that, that you know many of those public health side felt that it was imperative that this was built in. Um, any yeah. members want to make comment on this? Kelly? Yeah, um, this this will sound a bit left of field, but it actually draws back to this. Um, with regards to drinking up time, can I just get a wee bit of clarification with regards to what it applies to? So we know later in the book we'll be talking about underage um, people attending functions and so on. <coughs> Drinking up time allow hotels, pubs, whatever are holding an underage function where alcohol is not available for that drinking up time to apply to those functions, or is it just where alcohol is sold? The drinking up time only applies where alcoholic drinks are being sold. Okay, so it doesn't allow, uh, say, for instance, a hotel that has a function who, that has alcohol being sold in the hotel, but there's a function room with a uh, school formal or something on in a separate part that. That part of the hotel would mean that the, the drinking up time there is not, it doesn't apply, but it, it does apply. to the rest of the hotel. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Members, any um, more comments they want to make on that? I, sorry, Chair. Uh, could I, I come just briefly, please, and, and after declaring interest as well? See, by, like, would they accept that, that this clause and extend at drinking up time? Is that optional then for licensed premises? I mean, they can extend drinking up time to the hour, but does that mean that they have to and, and that the customer has a right, therefore, that once they order a pint that last orders or whatever, that they can't be shifted for an hour? No, it, it, it wouldn't be a right. Um, the, the, the license holder is control, in control of the licensed premises at all times. Um, but it would be good practice if, if a particular bar was only going to permit uh, a maximum of 30 minutes drinking up. Uh, they would, should really be telling customers at the time yeah. they're buying their last orders, you know, you only have half an hour. Uh, it, it would just be, it could cause some unpleasantness if after half an hour, excuse me, somebody uh, was told, right, you know, out you go. And you said, hang on a minute, I thought I had an hour. So yeah, it's not it's not compulsory by any means, and of course applying for for late opening uh, isn't isn't compulsory either. I mean, some bars will apply and some won't. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, any further um, questions they want to ask the department on the extension of drinking up time? Are we happy we move on? Somebody's phone is ringing. Um, okay, we'll move then on to clause seven which is licensed racetracks Sunday sales. Um, Carol, can you give an overview on this clause, please? Yeah, Chair, so I think this one's pretty self-explanatory and it will allow licensed racetracks to serve drink on a Sunday. Um, currently, they're not allowed to do that. Um, the public entertainment, um, place of public entertainment um, category of premises would say fall under, currently allow other premises to open between 12.30 and 10. Um, on a Sunday, but that the provision of alcohol, the sale of alcohol, is 30 minutes prior to the entertainment that is on and 30 minutes after that within those hours of 12.30 and 10. 
Okay, thanks, Carl. And members um, will know we received limited evidence on this clause. Strumbo Park welcomed the plans, and Hospitality also stated that legislation for race courses under places of public <coughs> entertainment should be amended to include the sale of alcohol on Sunday, with the provision um, that alcohol can only be sold as part of a main meal, which is similar to uh, licensed restaurants. Members, any comments on that? Are happy enough with that one? Yeah, yeah we're, okay. we're okay with that one, yeah? All right. Okay, then we're going to then move on to our second set of clauses. Members, the second set of clauses we'll consider, we will consider are those related to regulation. That is clause 3, 9, 14, 15, 18, 19, 20, 20 and 21. Um, the summary of evidence we have received on these clauses can be found in document 2 of your meeting pack and that starts at page 617. Um, clause 3 then is the alignment of closing time for liquor and entertainment. So Carl, can I ask you to give us a, an overview on clause 3? Yes, clause 3, it ensures that the entertainment has to stop at the end of the drinking up time. If an entertainment licence is granted beyond that time, then the additional hours after 11 o'clock are invalidated and the drink has to stop being sold at 11. Okay, thanks, Carl. Uh, members, you'll recall from evidence sessions that there has been mixed responses um, to this proposal in the bill. It's been welcomed by a range of stakeholders as being a more logical approach than the current situation and that it would make it easier for the PSNI to enforce liquor licensing laws. However, some in the sector, such as Hospitality Ulster and the Beer and Pub Association, feel that it would only support it if other extensions to permitted hours and drinking up time are granted. There was other submissions expressing disquiet regarding the proposals, uh, reasons such as it does not permit any flexibility for a licensee who wishes, with good intentions, to provide entertainment beyond the hours of their, local al or their alcohol licence, and it has potential to fetter the discretion and powers of local councils and prevent them from acting um, to suit local circumstances. Um, I suppose I'll just ask uh, Lamer Carroll any comment on that, especially the bit around local councils and um, preventing them from acting. Well, Chair, Ch I think look, local council can still issue an entertainment licence to 5 or 6 a.m. if they wish. And it just happens, as Carol explained, that the liquor license will, will cease to have effect from uh, 11 p.m. The, the night before. So they can have entertainment, um, but without drink. Okay. Uh, I mean, the, the reason for this uh, proposed amendment uh, was down to premises that were uh, abusing the entertainment license and continuing to operate as pubs and, and having an unfair advantage uh, against those law abiding premises who were closing at, at the correct time. No, I understand that. Um, uh, any members want to, uh, any clarification on anything to do with um, Clause 3? <laughs> No, Kelly, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I've had a, a number of um, concerns raised from entertainers, as you can imagine, because um, if some of them want to continue on longer, so just so we're absolutely clear on this, um, if the entertainment license goes on longer than the liquor license, then the liquor stops at 11. It's not a case that the extension to one o'clock or two o'clock with the drinking up time is added to that. So it's it's if you want to go on longer than the liquor license and takes you, then it, everything the liquor license the, the existing rules mean that you stop serving alcohol at eleven p.m. But the entertainment can continue on. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I think there's just a lot of entertainers are sort of saying what would be the point and they'll lose business. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier on, um, hospitality has had a hard time. This committee has definitely heard the entertainment and artists have definitely had a hard time over this. Um, I just don't understand why 11, why liquor licensing would stop at 11 if entertainment's going on, say, for instance, to four or five. Why was that chosen and not one o'clock? That, that, that invalidates the Article 44. Okay. So the Article 44 gives you your extension from 11 to uh, to 1, 1 a.m. Okay. Um, that's what it invalidates that. 
Um, I mean, uh, entertainers will have the opportunity if, if the rest of the amendments here are passed by the Assembly and, and, and yeah. go into law. Uh, they'll have a, a, a much greater opportunity to provide entertainment than they currently have or they had before the pandemic. I yeah. that, that, you know, that was why be, then that Hospitality Ulster was saying they would support it if the yeah. other extensions within the within the bill were were passed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that panic that's happening at the minute when people are saying liquor licensing and entertainment are being aligned and they haven't realised, well, actually, you can apply for your extension under Article 44. You know, there are ways to have um, entertainment and um, liquor sold at the same time later or earlier in the morning, whichever way you want to put it. Um, but it's just at this stage, if you if you were to have, say, for instance, uh, a club that wants to keep going to five or six in the morning, they can certainly have entertainment to that time, but the liquor side of it stops at 11 the previous night. Yeah, yeah that's correct. Yeah, we can. I don't think, you know, I don't think there's a, a large amount of premises anymore that want to stay open until the, the, the four or five. Um, I think what we had heard at the beginning of all of this was that three o'clock would be a standard for those nightclub um type of premises so if the other if the other clauses uh, were forthcoming then that that would all fit in okay so if that drinking up time is there the entertainment does the entertainment stop when the bar closes basically or the drinking up time end of drinking up time end of drinking up time so it, it does, does take them right through to three o'clock if they've mm -hmm. applied for that okay can, can yeah. I just ask, and it's maybe got nothing to do with this, but I remember whenever I was sort of that age, 1920, there was a nightclub in Belfast that uh, was called Shadows, and it actually opened at midnight, but you brought your own alcohol. Um, is there anything, does that still exist, that type of thing? That, does that still happen? Um, you, you brought your own alcohol and the bar served you your soft drinks, uh, your mixers and things like that. Uh, and it opened to 6 a.m. on it was a Saturday night into Sunday morning. Um, uh, yeah, remember it well. Uh, does that? I don't know, Liam or Carl. Is it? Do we still have things like that that happen, or is there anything? Or have you have heard anything about that? I don't believe so. It's been a long time since I've <laughs> been out and about at those sorts of venues as well. But no, I I, I don't Carl, believe so. I'm not aware of anywhere of that nature now, um, and what what I, the, the club you were talking about or the, the venue was simply trying to get round uh, late opening, and I think you'd probably find that at that time bars were closing at eleven o'clock in the evening. Yeah. No, just just asking. Um, just another thing I just want to bring up um, was in relation to um, the disparity of the definition of entertainment in the entertainment license and the licensing order. Uh, and we had various witnesses who wanted to see that modernised, the likes of where you would maybe have um, a, a World Cup that is being shown in a different time zone. So therefore, um, they were wanting to show it on uh, TV screens and things like that. So just around those, those issues to do with the definition of entertainment. The definition of entertainment, Chair, uh, is that whoever is providing the entertainment, and it's drawn quite widely, uh, has to be present in the, in the premises. Um, so th there was some discussion where people felt that a DJ didn't uh, qualify as entertainment, but, but that's incorrect. Uh, a, a DJ does uh, count as entertainment provided they are present in the premises. Um, what wouldn't count as entertainment for purposes of a late license would be somebody putting on one of the music uh, television channels uh, and simply playing music through uh, the television. Uh, and, and allowing uh, patrons to, to dance or, or uh, enjoy that music. So, um, and the thing about a, a late, uh, a, a late uh, football match in another time zone, um, I mean, it isn't just about providing entertainment. If the venue provides food, uh, well, then they qualify for their Article 44 currently uh, anyway. So they, they can provide food to people who wanted to watch a match uh, in another time zone. Okay. Um, so that could, be, that could be bar food? It's not necessary. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Could I just double check on that then? So just thinking of something like a live aid. Now I am in that ancient that I watched it. Um live. Um something like that then isn't wouldn't be entertainment, wouldn't be able to qualify unless there was food being served. Yeah, that's right. The, the entertainers have to be present in the venue. Now, this only applies for the late period from uh, 11 uh, p.m. on. So something like Live Aid, um, Kelly, which took place from, I remember it well, uh, from, from lunchtime right through. 
Uh, yeah. I mean, the painters could sit in a bar and watch that throughout the afternoon and into the evening, but it would be after 11 o'clock for, in order to qualify for that late licence, uh, entertainment or uh, food would have to be provided. Okay, okay. Okay. No, it's just it's interesting because we know the likes of American football has now become extremely popular and it um, it will be shown during the night, so it will, and I know it's extremely popular here as well. Um, so it's just, I know that those issues did come up, um, but if there's bar food being um, uh, sold, then they can't go ahead. Okay. Right, that's all right. I'm all right with, with that. Members, any other comments? Um, what was that, Clause, Clause 3 it was? Um, any other comments on Clause 3 or anything that more than one day ask of the department? Mark, can we bring Mark into the spotlight? He's dropped out just, <coughs> sorry. There, Mark, you're back in again. Sorry. I think you probably put me out because my bloody phone keeps ringing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, yeah, you kind of I covered it there, and it was on at sporting events or like a Kelly says a concert televised. Now, you see, in terms of major events, could there be a bit of crossover there? Like, like you know, say Ireland are playing in the Rugby World Cup or the Soccer World Cup, or, or Northern Ireland are playing in, in, in the, the Soccer World Cup, and there's a nine a.m. kickoff. Or, or whatever, could, could that be classed as a major event in any way, shape, or form? Chair, are, are we moving on to discuss that clause? Um, no, I'm sorry about that, but there is a bit of crossover there. there. So we sorry. did a crossover but, that, no, but we're not, we're not no, at the, that clause yet, but there is a bit of crossover. I, but, but, yeah, so just, just to explain maybe the, the background to the major events clause, uh, then, uh, Chair, the, the major events clause is about uh, supporting and encouraging tourism and bringing visitors to Northern Ireland to improve our uh, tourism offer. Uh, and it came about through the number of major events that uh, came to Northern Ireland uh, or had planned to come to Northern Ireland and faced difficulties with our uh, licensing regime. So you had the, the, uh, the MTV Music Awards who wanted to have their after show party and had great difficulty because uh, the event was held on a Sunday and the bars had to close at midnight on a Sunday. We also had the Open Golf Championship then uh, last year at uh, Royal Port Rush, sorry, the year before, 2019, um, and they had difficulty as well. It was quite late in the day when they realised that the um, licensing laws here were very different from those in GB, where they have been holding the Open Championship every year for, for many years. So this, this is about tourism. It's not about um, uh, people drinking in bars to late at night because there's a boxing match in Las Vegas or a rugby match in New Zealand. It's, it's, uh, it's not about that at all. I so the major event has to be happening here. Okay, no. Yeah, the, the, the clause is very clear on that. And that's not to say that members will want to uh, put down their, their own amendment uh, or introduce a new clause, but, but this clause was very much a response to lobbying from the tourism industry uh, around making Northern Ireland more attractive to the organisers of these really large international prestigious events that can showcase Northern Ireland as a venue. Okay, thanks, Norm. I didn't mean to jump on the different clause, but I was wondering if something no, wasn't I'm... able to be classified as entertainment per se, could it be classified in another way, but thank you. I would say, Mark, if, if Northern Ireland or indeed the Republic of Ireland made it to the Football um, World Cup, that would be <laughs> very much a major event <laughs> for the entire <laughs> island of Ireland. No, that's fair enough. Um, OK, members, are we happy enough? Um, I have lost my place. Can somebody tell me where we are? Plus four are we on? Yeah. Well, nine. Nine. Just nine. Four. Page, what's it? Six, two, three. Yeah, these are a different page. Just to me at the minute. So Just that was... Clause Three. Clause so nine. Yeah, yeah, clause nine. Thank you very much for that. Got a bit lost there, um, which is um, quite surprised it took me so long to get a bit lost. Okay, so we're going to move on then to clause nine, which is the requirement for off license. So, Carl, if you can just give us a, a brief overview on that. Yeah, certainly. So this covers where a sale is made remotely. So maybe over the telephone or more likely online at the minute. Um, and the premises that the drink is dispatched from um, has to be licensed premises. Um, the clause also requires a delivery driver 
who isn't acting on behalf of a licensed premises to so say for example if a if a taxi driver was sent to, to collect um to collect drink for somebody um that that delivery has to be made without unreasonable delay and that the delivery driver has to carry the receipt associated with that actual sale okay thanks carl uh, members just to remind you our evidence in general supported uh, this strengthening of the law around delivery of alcohol particularly that it should ensure that the dial a drink type service run uh, without proper enforcement or monitoring will in future be, uh, be able to be policed properly however there were a number of concerns raised around increased availability through delivery and around the practicality of the clause um, for a number of reasons. Um, these are due to the increased number of intermediary companies now offering delivery services, um, also how to ensure delivery drivers are over 18, and the practicality of this clause beyond licensee uh, deliveries and age verification at delivery addresses. I know it was something that was certainly discussed with our Young People event on, on Tuesday evening that we had as well. Um, so it's just, if, uh, Liam or Carl, if you want to make any comments on any of the issues that the committee have highlighted, um, I know certainly uh, the, the, we have the likes of um, various things that get delivered by Royal Mail as well to anyone, you know, they're just left at your house, whether that's a craft gin club, beer club, Virgin Wines, Lathwaite's, whatever it is, um, they are just delivered. Um, so. Uh, just uh, it's not covering all of those um, issues and um, the place and I also highlighted a number of gaps in licensing legislation that have come to attention during the pandemic relating to roadside van sales of open pints and drinks and off selling of open alcohol pints and cocktails from their off sales um, so just where does that fall into this as well then well, I mean, I think, Chairman, the, 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 um, the, the issue that we're trying to address here is, is those illegal sales that you talked about, where um, individuals uh, purchase uh, a large bulk of, of alcoholic drinks from a supermarket and then deliver them through the night, uh, either by a taxi or, or just from their own car. Um, I mean, it doesn't take very long if you go on to certain social media to find these uh, illegal operators. Now, this will bring it into line that they uh, they will have to have a receipt from the um, from the the off -li license where they bought the drink, and, and have stopped by the police to produce that and and and, and, and uh, convince the, the the constable that they have uh, delivered this drink on behalf of a customer without on due delay. Um, the issue about roadside uh, pints is, is a new one, and uh, there was some case law uh, around that about deliveries. Um, the police do have concerns, and it emerged during the, the, the pandemic where people were buying pints to, to stand out on the street or pavement and, and drink, um, which caused uh, issues around uh, um, disorder or potential disorder. So the, the, the current COVID restrictions prevent the sale of open uh, open uh, pints. Uh, drink can only be sold to, to take away if it's in the manufacturer's container. So that essentially means within a bottle or, or, or a can. Um, but there's nothing in, in this bill that uh, discusses that. It, it, it's obviously something that has come up since the bill was agreed by the executive last July. Um, and if if uh, members were minded to put down an amendment, it's certainly something that our minister would consider. Yeah, because we did see it, especially over the summer last year during COVID, of um, uh, the likes of pints with a plastic lid on top of it being transported um, around the, around various parts of the country. Um, so it, it's just then um, about. The, I also want to ask you about the delivery drivers and them being over the age of eighteen. I would imagine that most delivery drivers that work for the supermarkets or work for taxi companies are over the age of eighteen. I wouldn't imagine there's too many that are under that age. Um, but it's just then, um, the, the, I know certainly our young people had brought that up if they were um, a deliver or they were a delivery person and they were 17 because they had their license, um, that that would put them at a disadvantage of, of getting a job. Um, what, just, just if you want to make no, a comment. The, the, this issue has come up as well, Chair, in relation to uh, delivery of, of uh, alcohol to the supermarkets as part of their bulk delivery. Um, I mean, the, the, the license and order is about the retail sale of alcoholic drinks. And anyone who's working and, and uh, has an exemption, if, if they're receiving the drink on behalf of the, of the company, it's not a retail sale, it's a, it's a, a delivery. 
Okay. All right. Okay. That that clears that yeah. that issue up. Members, anything else they want to bring up, Kelly? If your hand up. Yeah. Um. I was just actually wondering. Um. Just as as the chair has talked about there, there's a crossover here with Department of Infrastructures. Um passenger carrying vehicles legislation um as as the chair has said anybody who's a taxi driver bus driver um will have because it's a public service vehicle um they won't be under they won't be under 18 because you can't get a license like that if you're under 18 it's it's all tied in with insurance but i'm just wondering is there any and the reason why i'm asking that is because the fine why a thousand pounds why not more and why is there no link into um, disqualification or uh, points on, for instance, a, a taxi driver's license or, um, you know, somebody, even a, even a, a haulier, um, you know, under the C category licenses that drive lorries and vans, um, that they could face professional disqualification if they're caught acting illegally? Uh, good points, uh, Kelly. The the, uh, the the simple answer is that we always take advice from the Department for Justice on the scale of, of any fines or, or punishments that are, uh, that are included on any of our legislation uh, on conviction of an offence. So we, we are guided very much by the Department for Justice. Um, the issue around um, you know, points on licences and, and relocation of, of uh, a driving licence, uh, again, a matter for the Department of Infrastructure, but if, if uh, the committee were minded to impose some sort of a, a penalty like that, it's certainly something we would discuss with them. Um, you know, traditionally, uh, offences against the licensing order have been dealt with by way of a fine, uh, a, a prison sentence, or if you are a license holder, a points on your liquor license. Yeah, there's there's actually, um, I know that there was talk, I previously worked with transport and DFI, um, of penalties against um, transport operators. So it's not necessary to say you have a, a one-man band or one-woman band taxi. Um, that's one thing. But where you have uh, an operator with two or more vehicles, um, that the actual operator could end up losing their operator's license if they had enough points gathered up against them. It's something that certainly would, would deter, I think, more people um, than getting involved in this. Thing. The other thing I wanted to ask you about was um, you talked there, and I absolutely agree, you know, that if people are buying off sales, um, that it would be in a in a container. Um, when we look at the bars who, to be honest, were quite innovative over the summer period during lockdown when they were selling pints from their bars, what would... <laughs> How, what would prevent them from getting branded glasses or branded plastic containers? Um, would that meet within the requirements? Or, you know, I think we just need to be careful because people are as innovative of as, as they can possibly be if there's a way to make money. Um, so you could have XYZ pub has XYZ branded um, plastic containers with a plastic lid on it. Um, would that come within the scope? Uh, no, Kelly, just to be clear, the, the restriction on the sale of takeaway drink um, uh, is, is a COVID regulation which is time limited and, and is subject to review every, every four weeks or so. Um, and uh, what it says is that it must be within the manufacturer's uh, package, which means that it has arrived on the licensed premises within that package uh, sealed. So, uh, you know, having a, a, a branded uh, glass, for example, uh, and, and filling it with that particular beer and then putting a lid on it uh, wouldn't meet that requirement. But that is not a requirement within this, this uh, bill. It, it, is, it, is, uh, it is a health regulation in order to restrict the, the sale of alcohol during the pandemic, and it will expire when the health regulations uh, are, are um, allowed to expire. Should we be considering moving it across into this? Well, it's, it's possible, um, but you'll have to ask, uh, you know, the, the reason for uh, the, the rules now is that there's a pandemic where you don't want people gathering outside. Uh, uh, if, if, if someone is delivering, um, say, for example, uh, you know, four uh, pints of, uh, of draft beer to somebody's house because they're having a few friends around, um, well, what harm is it causing? You know, they, they can go to they can go to an off sales and buy as much wine or beer as they wish. You know, the, the reason for the restriction currently is to do with uh, social distancing and, and preventing people from gathering outside bars. 
um, and hopefully that will expire as the pandemic recedes. Yeah. The last one I'm just going to ask you on this one here, we're presuming that it would be taxi drivers, but we also have a growth in urban areas of, of bicycle deliveries. I take it this um, delivery um, part within this legislation extends to all types of deliveries? Yes, and uh, I mean it isn't just taxi men. It is anybody who who uh, they may not hold a taxi license at all, but they fill their garage or, or front room full of cheap drink, and then decide they're going to operate it via Facebook, selling drink throughout the night. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Kelly. And I think you made up brought up some good points there, especially around fines. I would say that all of us as constituency MLAs would know exactly who to phone at 2 a.m. in the morning if we felt that we wanted to purchase whatever and we know exactly who would be delivering them as well. Um, so I think that's good points. Um, so do uh, whenever it comes to, to this. Members, what I am going to suggest at this moment is that we take um, a, a very short five minute comfort break for everyone. And then when we come back, we'll look at clause 14. Are members in agreement? Yeah? Agreed. Okay, thank you. B9. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. All right, members, um, we're going then to move on to Clause 14, which is restaurants and guest houses notice displaying licence conditions. Um, again, Carol, can I ask you just to give a brief overview on that? Sorry, Chair, I don't know if it was just me. You completely cut out there. Okay. I caught my name at the I'll end. Okay, start again, um, so well. Can members hear me? Yeah. You can hear me now? Okay. We're going to move on to Clause 14, which is restaurants and guest houses and the notice displaying licence conditions. Um, so, Carla, if you heard that, can you go and um, give us a, a brief overview of that? Chair, through you, can I just go back to Clause 9? Sorry, I had my yeah. hand up, but I don't know if anybody can see me or not. So, um, Sorry, it was just a clarity. And it's a clarity in terms of the delivery drivers being over 18. So, the way the current licence and order deals with employees who are under 18 is slightly different in terms of deliveries coming in and deliveries going out. So deliveries coming in, as Liam rightly said, are classed as um, wholesale deliveries. So an under 18 can take collection of those. Um, whenever an under 18 is employed in say a supermarket, the license holder is responsible for supervising that under 18 at all times whenever they are in a licensed area. So that could be the display area or whenever they're at a till. Whenever you get the deliveries then, if it's an under 18, and I believe this is where the policy came from originally, they wouldn't have that level of supervision. So it's actually illegal under the current licensing law for a young person to be sent to obtain drink um, that is being sold for consumption off the premises. Um, so if a license holder did allow that to happen, they would be, they would be responsible for that. If it was somebody, um, you know, if it wasn't a license holder sending a young person in to do that, again, they, they would they would be responsible for that, um, and it is an offence under the current law. No, look, thank you for that uh, clarification, um, Carl, as well. And I suppose that that'll, that alleviates some of those fears that some of those smaller um, businesses had, um, that maybe would have had staff under 18 that were taking deliveries, so that that kind of that, that allays that and puts that to bed. So, um, yeah, well, I think you, you, you tend to know, sorry, sorry, Chair, you tend to notice um, even if you're doing your own online order, um, during times whenever you actually are legally allowed to purchase and receive alcohol, um, some supermarkets would have it blocked out. Yeah. 
where no alcohol is allowed at a random time, say between two and four on a, um, you know, on a Saturday. And I think that's what that relates to. It relates to the fact that their delivery driver is actually at the upper end. They might be just, you know, they're just short of 18. Okay, no, that's good to know. No, thanks for that, Carl. All right, um, are you happy to move on then, Carl, to clause 14 then and give us the overview? Yeah, certainly. So that's restaurants and guest houses. Um, so the clause 14 requires a license holder of a restaurant to display a notice um, somewhere prominent that states how alcohol can be sold. So um, the information would be prescribed by regulations, but in general, the, the, the requirements of a restaurant or indeed a restaurant and a guest house drink can only be sold whenever it's ancillary to the main table meal. It has to be paid for at the same time and it has to be on the same bill as the food. So you shouldn't be able to go in and just sit and have a drink and then get up and leave again. Um, the restaurant is the main business that's being carried on there. Okay, thanks for that. And I suppose then, as you know, the main comments that we had around that clause were from the industry, um, all on a similar thread that the requirement will, is unlikely um, to have um, to make to make any difference. And I know the, the vast, vast majority of restaurants and guest houses are are responsible. But I do know again from being a constituency MLA, and I'm sure all of us could name particular a restaurant in our own areas that operate as a bar and are doing that and it is extremely difficult and uh, you know I don't know how we're going to stop that happening um, I, I know certainly one in my own area where the council have been involved the police have been involved it's been going on for years and we're still they're, they're still flouting the rules and, and operating um, as a bar as opposed to a, a restaurant and they only pay, pay a license for a restaurant um, so I suppose that that's my only comment on that. Any members have any other comments they want to make on that? No, everybody's yeah. I think it's pretty much. I mean, there's there's no there's no reason why it shouldn't go ahead, but we don't see it making too much of a difference. I suppose there's a wee bit of background noise, folks. So if there's a shuffling papers or moving about, put yourself on silent, please. Um, uh, Again, members, anything there? No, happy enough we move on with that one? Yeah? Okay. All right, we're going to move then to clause 15 and 30. And this is the prohibition of self-service and sales by vending machines. Um, Carol, then, can you then um, talk us through 15 and 30, please? Yeah, so clause 15 again is for your licensed premises and 30 refers then to the registered clubs. So each of those clause clauses prohibits the any drink from being sold without direct supervision. So it could be things like pour your own pint tables or the, the vending machines, which are specifically mentioned. There's a power included there as well um, that would allow those sales by vending machines anywhere that has accommodation. So a pub with accommodation, a hotel or a guest, a guest house that in the future, should there be a benefit or a need for those that, that regulations could allow that. Okay, I suppose that's good to know because uh, the vast majority of people that we had in absolutely agreed with this clause that that, that should be done away with. Um, but then there were there were some others that brought up, you know, um, I think it was was it Nilga maybe about uh, you know we don't want to throw out any new innovation that might come into place. So I suppose that would allow would that allow the, um, the, the, what you were speaking about there at the end, Carl, for any new innovation that might have come into place. Other issues that were raised was to do with um, <laughs> excuse me, click and collect, um, the storage, you know, where you would maybe have put your order in and then you go to pick it up. Um, uh, does, will, will this harm that in any way at all? And uh, it's just that they're the only things that were really brought up with us around that. Any comments okay, the, on the, those? Sorry, the, the, the click and collect storage, the sale has already taken place. Um, so the click and collect storage wouldn't be captured, wouldn't be captured there. Um, you know, I think the comments there about the, the you know, the, the issues may be rare. They may be rare, but the implications of them are potentially very, very dangerous um, whenever levels of consumption aren't supervised. So and the opportunity for underage access there as well. Um, and I know there were comments made about, you know, where you could have a, a set, you know, you could have a table um, in, a, in a pub where the licensee has to come over and turn a key and limit the amount. But it's perfectly legal for somebody that is age 16 to go into a bar with an 18 year old and the 18 year old accepts the bar, the, the bar manager turns the key, gives out the amount of alcohol, 
<clears throat> and then maybe the bar gets very, very busy and you can't see the under the, the, the 16 year old or the 17 year old is the one that's actually consuming. So I think we just need to be very careful um, because of the potential for harm. Um, and again, for stifling innovation, and there was a mention there about, I think, a driver's license and blowing into a breathalyzer. If there's nobody there to, if there's nobody there to supervise that, there are ways around that. It is open to abuse. You know, who's to know that the person blowing into the breathalyzer is the person, you know, who maybe isn't then going to go in the car. You know, the, the person who's blowing into the breathalyzer might be perfectly sober, but they could also be under 18. Um, and the person beside them is intoxicated, so I think that direct that 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 supervision is the key here for for this clause. Uh, just on another question, that I know I have stayed, um, I stayed in a guest house uh, uh, a few years ago, and they had uh, like an honesty box. So they did uh, in the, at the end of the hallway where you could have uh, you they just you, you just put your money in as you know what an honesty. Of course, everybody knows what an honesty box is, but this was for for alcohol. So it was. What way does that fall under this? question yeah <laughs> i just hadn't thought of it actually whenever we were we were looking at it um whenever we the evidence sessions on it it's just it just sort of came into my head there because when you had mentioned about guest houses and hotels um that they did that and uh and it was very well run and everybody was very honest and did what they did but um so it's just it, it's just another issue that does come up in the likes of guest houses where you've got a small guest house and instead of them having um, you know, the, that uh, a bar or uh, any type of vending machine, they just have an honesty box. So that might be something we need to look at as well. Um, members, any questions or comments? Anything else they want to raise or anything they want to expand on on 15 and 30? Just on that um, click and collect, Chair, um, is there any difficulty with that? Now, at the minute, we tend to have a Northern Ireland click and collect whether it's a human being hands stuff over but if there was ever a system where it was like a locker that you went to um and, and collected your groceries that happened to have um drink in it or whatever it might be you're collecting um would this prevent that it, it wouldn't prevent that no i mean the, the terminology that's used in the clause i believe is where the 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 customer use, physically uses the dispenser of alcohol, so they dispense the alcohol themselves. So again, the, the sale has already taken place whenever you're talking about a click and collect. And I believe as well, having used the click and collect storage boxes, there are it, it's similar to um, a self-service point in a supermarket where you have to type in your age and there's an age verification process there. Um, but it wouldn't be the click and collect wouldn't be captured under this, no. Okay. I know that was something that you just mentioned there, Carl, about the self-service. Um, public health sector had believed that that should also that this that this should be included in self-service checkouts. Um, albeit, I do know because I use self-service checkouts myself that that the member of staff does have to come along um, and and verify that the, that the, that the person buying it is your age. So you see that as that will be perfectly fine to continue. Yeah. Yeah, I don't believe there's I don't believe there's been any issues raised there. I mean, the license the license holders in the supermarkets, you know, they they have a responsibility under their license to ensure that age there's you know that, that they check the age under age sales. Um, has it hasn't it hasn't been raised through it hasn't been raised an issue with the department through click and collect or through sorry um self service tills no. Okay, um, can I just ask that Mark Durkin be brought back into the the spotlight again? There, Mark, you're back in the spotlight again. You must be having a few troubles this morning with your internet. So just to let you know, you're back and um, we, we can hear you if you're not on silent. Um, okay. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> okay, members, <laughs> anybody want to make any further comment before we move on uh, on clause 15 and 30? No? All right. Okay, then we'll move on then to clause 18, which is occasional licenses um, conditions. So again, Carl, can I ask you just to give us an overview on this clause also? Yeah, so the clause will allow the police um, to go to the courts whenever the application is being heard to place conditions on an occasional licence, so at that time of granting. Currently, conditions can only be placed where issues have arisen in the past for function that have been held, um, held on a site where an occasional licence has been granted and only really where the function has caused undue inconvenience to local residents. Um, the clause will also ensure that there's a um, failure to comply um, with any of those conditions will be an offence. 
Okay, thanks, Carol. Um, and again, this uh, generally had agreement, but there were some issues were raised as well. And I'll just read out those issues that the clause has the potential to create a complicated method of granting an occasional um, permission, and also concerns that if courts impose strict conditions under the existing occasional licence regime, this would prevent important events and festivals from taking place. However, um, it may be, uh, the, uh, as Carl had said, that it would assist police uh, at those events, and then need for safeguards that allows the applicant to challenge any condition that believes it is unjustified, and the possibility of including provision for an organisation to apply for an occasional licence in order to hold a festival or event without the need for an existing premises licence holder, and then also that they they're, they're uh, seen not fit for purpose by some local producers who find themselves worse off as they currently use occasional licences in order to hold occasional taproom events. On this also, uh, there's a variation, as we had heard in one of our witness sessions across Northern Ireland, in granting these occasional licences for tap rooms and events. Um, so it's just on those issues that were raised during our, our evidence sessions, Liam and Carol. Any comments on any of those? Well, the clause, uh, the, the clause won't change the application process. The application process remains the same. Um, so I'm just not too sure about the, the complicated reference there. Um, the, the addition is that the police can ask for conditions to be placed at, at, the, at the outset. Um, again, in terms of the strict conditions, the idea here is to address issues where, as part of the discussions with the police, um, for grant, granting the licence, or excuse me, <clears throat> as, part of, as part of the discussions that would have been held with the police, the organisers for these events will promise to do um, a, B or C, and whenever the actual event comes, if it doesn't fit within their plans for that event, they might not carry out those agreements. Um, it could be down to security, it could be where you have drink and non-drink zones, it could be um, you know, specified underage areas or family areas. Um, so it really is, I don't, I don't think it's a case of um, that there should be any concern about the strict conditions preventing actually events taking place. It's just to make sure that the promises were made at the very beginning that allowed them to have the license granted um, are actually are actually you know followed through. Um, the safeguards there for the applicant to challenge that's included in the bill. So clause eighteen three um, allows allows the, the the licensee to go to the magistrate's court, um, and if the magistrate's court believe that it's appropriate, then those conditions could be varied or even removed. Um, if they're well, an appeal, I suppose, for want of a better word. Um, in terms of the organisation, the or, an organisation being able to apply, yeah. the whole licensing regime, a prospective license holder has to go through a court process and they have to prove fitness. Um, a court looks at your character, your reputation, your financial standing, your qualifications, your experience. Um, the license holder for those occasional licenses is the one that's ultimately responsible for what goes on in terms of the sale of drink at those events. So if that license holder is continually um, applying for occasional licenses and at those events where somebody else is the organiser, issues are arising in terms of the sale of alcohol, they can be punished, they can have points, they find guilt, they're the ones that are found guilty of an offence, they have points placed on their licence which can ultimately result in suspension or the revocation of that license in the worst case scenario. If you've got a non-license a non holder, so you've got an organisation, as you know, what's the worst that can happen sort of thing? Um, I just, I, I wouldn't see how that would fit with the current licensing regime. I don't know if Liam maybe has anything to add to that one. No, Ch Chair, um, licensing magistrates and, and judges uh, have vast experience of dealing with these issues and uh, any um, conditions that a, a licensed uh, applicant disagrees with, as Carol says, they can uh, apply to the magistrates court to have them varied if they believe they're unreasonable. There's also the option for a judicial review if, if, if that fails. So there's plenty of uh, checks and balances within the system. This is really about generally protecting young people. The issues that came to light in the past around festivals were where uh, agreements were put in place that young people who, who were underage uh, would be separated away from the drink area and, and when it came to 
uh, practice on the day that wasn't complied with and, and young people were able to make their way into the licensed area. So uh, where the conditions aren't complied with there will be consequences for the licence holder and I don't think anybody should, should uh, be terribly concerned about that because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a perfectly sensible approach. Yeah, I suppose just then to expand on that, and this I might be totally wrong here, um, but I know of various things, and say even uh, the, in Glengormley where we have had maybe a Christmas market and festival where there's been a, a, um, a, a local brewer, brewers have been there to sell their wares. Um, in order for that to go ahead, the, the I think it was the Glen Inn, which is one of our local bars, had to then, it was the, under their licence that this festival took place in Glengormley Park. Um, because there was no other way of the council being able to do that. Um, so, is this what this is this? Uh, how would that? Is that just to remain the same then? Yes, that will remain the same, Chair. Um, any event of this nature where an occasional licence is being used, it is the licence holder who applies to the court for the occasional licence. Um, they will comply with whatever conditions, and they'll be responsible um, should should things go wrong. Okay, but and, and I suppose what what had been asked then of us during the witness session was why then an organisation couldn't say it, and I understand what Carol was saying earlier, but if you had the likes of, of, a, of a large council who were taking responsibility um, as an organisation, um, uh, yeah, it would be, I mean, who, who do have licensed premises of their own as well. Um, it, it, it's just to see if there's a way around that, because I know that has been problematic yeah. for various uh, events where they have had to go to, and I had to say that, I mean, the, the local the local bar um, was more than happy to do it, but it's just it just seems a bit of a of an, a, a, a just a hurdle. That, um, the, the, the hurdle, the hurdle, chair. Sorry, is, is, is just that the, the it has to be a license holder. If if the council holds an appropriate license, uh, they can be the applicant, but they must hold the appropriate license. Okay, fair enough. No, that's no bother, Liam Kelly. You wanted to come in there. Yeah, I was just going to ask. Magistrates' courts close over the summer, so how does that give um, an option to appeal? Uh, and the magistrates' courts generally will work if there's a, a large event taking place. Um, the, the recorder of Belfast will work with the applicants on, on matters of this nature. Okay, um, and and just on the one about, I just wanted to ask. Say, for instance, something like the Christmas market in Belfast. I'm assuming at that event is that Belfast City Council's license that's used for that. I know it's on their grounds, but there are individual bars. I take it they are using their own license. Is that how that works? Well, Kelly, I wouldn't have the detail of I mean, that. Would be a commercial a decision by yeah. Belfast City Council, and um, but I understand that what they do is they they mark out certain areas that are set aside for uh, licensed premises, and then they ask for tenders from license holders who would then apply for a license, uh, an occasional license, to operate during the period of the Christmas market on that particular site. Um, oh. I mean, uh, the Belfast City Council really who could give us a detailed response on that. So there could, um, I'm just trying to work out how this could work. So at the minute we know that it's license holders can apply for an occasional license and it's not a case where they can just off, you know, get apply for an occasional license and let somebody else run with it because it does have potential quite difficult business. Um, um, results for them if anything goes wrong um, but I'm just wondering so if you have an occasional license actually in an area say um, the, the open up port rush so um, oh, that's a major event sorry I'm trying to think of something that would be comparable that's why I'm thinking about the Christmas market so if you have bars that are serving would they have to they're not covered under their own license for the occasional license they would have to actually have a separate occasional license within an occasional license, if you know what I mean. Um, I'm just trying to work out how that works. Well, I think the way it would work is that whoever the the, the bar that makes, reaches an agreement with Belfast City Council, let, let's just focus on the, the Christmas market as an example, um, they, they reach an agreement with Belfast City Council that they will run uh, the bar uh, on the particular site within the City Hall grounds. Uh, they would then apply to the Magistrates Court for their occasional license. Um, the, the, license the occasional license permits them to sell uh, alcoholic drinks uh, uh, in the same way as they would if they were in their own premises. 
Um, so they are responsible for providing staff, making sure staff are trained, uh, verification of age of any patrons entering the, the venue, and um, all the health and safety legislation within that venue and uh, the weights and measures, all those things. The, the license holder is responsible for all of that. Okay, okay. Um, and just to check then, um, if that bar, whoever it could be, um, is doing that type of activity, that's that's not part of their 104, sure it's not? Uh, that's a separate, completely separate? You know, so completely separate. You, can, you can't get 104 for occasional licences. It would just be yeah. for the, the bar and hotel, the normal premises. Okay. So that would be going to the 2am, yeah. Yeah. So where the issue has come up and it, it was raised for us um, by some of the witnesses where, for instance, um, a local supplier, local brewer um, has not been able to get or, you know, it, it, they're really dependent on others, occasional licenses um, to be able to hold tap room functions. Um, and it is it is it does seem to be a bit hit and miss across Northern Ireland as to how often those licenses are permitted. Um, the easiest way is if they would have their own license, then they could apply for their own occasional license. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. No, thanks for that. I just want to go back um, about the, the, the licences and, and looking at the likes of Belfast um, Christmas Market or Glen Gormley Christmas Market or Lisburn Christmas Market or whatever else, which are council run um, on council property, on council land, but yet councils can't apply uh, and they rely on all of those businesses and I know that does happen at the Belfast one where it is it's the various bars around Belfast that provide the licenses for those events yet if something were to happen it's not the council that are liable then but why does that work um that it, it's the it's the license holder um so you really are relying very much on um, an, an event being very well policed and well run and those license holders really are taking a risk every time they say yeah, okay, you can use my license because they're not necessarily. I know certainly the one in, in when we had it in Glengarry, they weren't making money from it. The license holder was not the person that was making the money. It was the various other people that were there selling their um, craft beers and, and various different things. They were the ones making the money. Um, so it's just it, it just seems a bit strange um, that they're put in that position. That's all I'm saying there. But uh, it doesn't even need an answer on it. I'm just it just is a bit strange um, that when we have big organisations that um, are unable to apply because they maybe do not have a hold a, a license, you know, the like I don't know if city council do or any of the other councils what they're like. But anyway, that's just a comment. Now that comes into play when when you talk about concerts, and I know we did have issues were raised about you know when there's quite a significant concert happening um, in different parts of Northern Ireland, um, you know. We, you might have, unfortunately, some maybe underage people who are preloaded and arrive at an event. Um, effectively, then, this legislation is stating that that type of activity would then fall under the responsibility of the occasional license holder, even though they maybe haven't sold the drink, um, even just by way of a, a security company have allowed that young person into the site or the grounds or whatever the wherever the event's happening. Um, I'm just wondering, is that is that part of the conditions? Is that where a, a license holder can lose their license or or receive a, a a fine if through no fault of their own others um, allow behaviours to happen that that wouldn't be within conditions? Well, I think Kelly, you know, that would be a matter for the court, um, and the license holder could use all those things that you mentioned as a, a legitimate defence that they had taken all proper steps, they had properly trained staff, they had doormen or women at the door to uh, prevent entry of anybody who was intoxicated, and that they, they had a duty of care over people who were intoxicated and dealt with them uh, properly. So, I mean, that, that would be a matter for the court to determine. Um, it's, it's never, it's never a cut and, and dry that um, you know this is this is an offence and you're convicted. You, you'll go and, and you'll have legal representation and state your case. Okay. Okay. No, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other members want to make any comment there before we move on to our, our next um, clauses? No. Nope, happy enough. Okay. Then we're going to move on then to clause 19 and 32. 
um, which is codes of practice. Um, Carol, again, if you can give, give an overview on that. Yeah, so this applies to licensed premises and registered clubs as well then, so 19 for the licenses and 32 for the registered clubs. So under each of those clauses, the department will be able to approve a code of practice that relates to the display, the sale or the promotion of alcoholic drinks. Um, the department will be required to consult the PSNI before approving um, any code that is brought to it. Um, and then there would be, um, in terms of the court process, whenever an applicant is granting or looking for the grant or the transfer of a licence, they would need to prove to the court that they're aware of their responsibility under any code that applies to them and for renewal that the licence holder has complied with those with the responsibilities under the code. Okay, thanks Carol for that. Um, members, you'll be very much aware that we heard a wide range of varying views on, on codes of practice, ranging from absolutely let's not um, let's not change what's already in place, it's perfectly good, to others that are saying that uh, the industry should actually have no involvement whatsoever um, when it comes to codes of practice. So it's just members, anything, any questions they want to raise uh, with Carol or Liam on that? No. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know um, where there has been a breach of the current code. Um, how many people, how, have, how many license holders have been fined, prosecuted, lost a license? Um, uh, Kelly, Chair, through the Chair, um, the, the current um, code is, is a voluntary uh, code. Uh, it has an independent chairman, uh, Duncan McCausland, the former PSNI Assistant uh, Chief Constable, and a, and a panel from health professionals and, and others. Um, but it doesn't ha have any statutory weight, so there's no such thing as, as a fine been issued on the result of a, of a finding from the current code. Uh, it's voluntary. What they do uh, do and has proven to be very uh, successful. They work with the licensed premises and explain to them where their code is inappropriate, or sorry, their their drinks promotion is inappropriate, um, and have managed to modify behaviour. And um, where somebody doesn't work with them, they would be named named and shamed effectively with uh, press releases uh, issued and uh, discussions on on, on well-known radio shows. So uh, that's how it's operated so far. Uh, I mean, the background to this goes back uh, maybe 10 years ago, where there were a lot of uh, what were considered irresponsible drinks promotions. Uh, and the minister at the time um, brought forward proposals to put um, the, a ban on various types of, of drinks promotion on the statute book. But whenever we were working with the, uh, the, the licensed trade uh, and the registered clubs, uh, we realised that uh, if you're if you're to put up all every possible drinks promotion uh, that we consider to be inappropriate or or, um, or causing problems for young people on the statute book, you, you get involved in a, in a game of cat and mouse where you are continually changing regulations almost on a monthly basis um, to. Uh, try and catch up with new developments where somebody comes up with a new idea to circumvent the, the law. Um, this code gives much greater flexibility. Um, they, they, they will discuss with the department any new types of, of promotions that uh, come forward. Uh, it's based around broad principles about not, uh, not encouraging people to drink more than, than they set out to drink, They're not encouraging people to drink quickly. Uh, and certainly not uh, uh, advertising drink in such a way as to appeal to young people. So it's, it brings great flexibility to it, and what the proposals in the bill does is uh, put certain conditions uh, in law that if you are, are, are going to be a, a, a or you apply to be a license holder, you have to be aware of what uh, responsible retailing looks like. You got to be aware of what irresponsible promotions are, and, and give an undertaking that you will comply with the code. Um, the reason for the, the consultation with the police is that uh, the, the police uh, have uh, uh, access to intelligence around uh, a lot of the uh, bad practices that go on and, and bring that to the attention. Um, the reason why I'm raising it is because we heard quite strong evidence coming through from the Institute of Social Marketing and Health at University of Stirling who said that voluntary code of practice should not be described as regulation, um, which they're not. Um, we're basically saying here that the, in this legislation, the proposal is that the department will pr approve a code. Is this not just c creating a, a bo an old boys network, as it used to be called? Um, because if you're in the clique, then you're within the code. But what happens if you're a newcomer or a 
different type of license or a different offer. And I just don't see how a code that covers a hotel would be the same for a supermarket or potentially a tap room or, you know, other occasional licenses. You know, I, I, the code seems to be quite specific to one particular area of alcohol consumption, alcohol sales, as opposed to what potentially it could be in the future. Well, the, the, the code that is currently in existence, as I said earlier, is, is a voluntary code. It hasn't been approved by the department, so the department will take into account how a code uh, takes account of the various ways in which alcohol is sold, uh, consumed and promoted. So, I mean, the department would not be signing off on a code that is, as, as you described, an old boys network. I mean, everybody, you, you don't have to pay to be a member of, of, of a code. You simply say that these are principles that I sign up to. Uh, I, I will not be selling drink in a way that appeals to young people. I will not be advertising or promoting um, uh, you know, drinking games, for example, that encourage people to drink um, pints of beer quickly or, or drink yards of ale or any of those sorts of uh, activities that were taking place in the past. So I don't think anybody's anything to fear from it. Um, if they don't sign up to a code that has been uh, designated by the department, uh, they won't get their licence renewed. So it's, in, it's up to them to make themselves aware of their obligations under the code, which is really about responsible retailing, and there's, there's nothing to fear from that. There's nothing to fear from it, but it depends who's on the board of the code. Um, I, I just have concerns, um, you know, when you talk about how they're going to um, manage the code and manage um, people um, um, abiding by that code as to out them in the media and on radio shows. Um, really, you know, because what happens if, if a group of hotels decides that they've had it and they've fallen out with somebody who's managing the code and then all, lo and behold that they're taken all over the media um, with allegations? Um, it's, it's a bit loose. I just wonder, um, this legislation, if the department, you know, if this goes forward and the department does approve a code, is the department basically given... Um, anecdotal evidence as opposed to investigated evidence um, more weight. I just have concerns and it was raised by some of our witnesses I think that the code as it currently stands is not bad to be honest but I do have a concern and I've experienced it myself in other industries where you have a group who decide a code and think that they're important everybody listens to them in actual fact they become bullies um, and I'm hoping that that would never happen but it we, we have a lot of regulations in this. I just think that the code it needs to be on a, a more than a voluntary footing. Uh, has the department had any considerations about moving it away from just a voluntary footing to make it something that's more prescribed or, or more defined or a duty? Well, what we've got here and in the proposals in the bill really is where the department will approve uh, a particular code. I mean, and, and part of the issues that the department will be looking at is that the people on the code are representative of the of the businesses as a whole. That they have a good standing in the community. That they have an ind independence. Um, and I think some of the people that they have around the table, in fact, all of the people that have around the table uh, in the current code uh, would, would meet those requirements. Now, whether that particular code is is the one that is uh, uh, designated by the department uh, is, is another matter. Uh, they'll have to put forward a, a proposal along with anybody else that was interested in, in doing so. Because it's, it's, it's no, there's no, it's not a given in the legislation that it will be the particular uh, code uh, that currently exists. But I mean, the, the benefit of a code, uh, any changes to the code will have to be agreed with the department. But it does bring flexibility that establishing something in uh, in statute doesn't doesn't need. Uh, you know, it doesn't need new new legislation every time a new type of uh, promotion uh, emerges. I understand. Um, can I just ask then, if the just this is a, a technical part, but if the department approves a code, does the department then are they required to consult on the content of the code before approval? I know you've said that they will consult with the police. Absolutely right to do so. But I'm thinking about yeah. the movement towards code production and code design, and also if it's a departmental approved code. With Whichever one would be would be chosen in the future, will there be an appeal mechanism? 
Well, within the, in the current process, they do have an, an appeal mechanism um, and they, they do uh, investigate thoroughly. But as I said, I mean, they, they try to work very closely with uh, the licensed trade and, and explain to people, you know, this is where you're going wrong. They also help provide, provide training for um, the staff around use of social media and so on, where a lot of the bad practice in the past has emerged. Um, so I, I mean that this is this is one of these things where the, the department will will take a, a light touch and, and see how things emerge. But we will be the department will be responsible for consulting with the police under statute. It would be good practice, as you say, Kelly, to consult more widely as well. And, and I would imagine that when the time comes, that will be done by way of a full public consultation. Here's here's what we believe uh, irresponsible drinks promotions look like. Uh, we remind it to appoint this particular group to uh, manage it on behalf of the department and uh, take on board views that come through from the public and other interested stakeholders. And just, I know that you've said that the, the current provision of the code is independent, and I very much welcome that, but if the department um, are approving a code, will the department be funding the code providers or do they remain independent? At the minute, they're independent, and there's been no discussion around uh, any funding line. Um, I mean, if, if you can get people to do um, a, a, a public service of this nature on a voluntary basis, um, you know, why, why would you would you put in place uh, a funding mechanism? I just would be worried. In the past, we've seen these sort of organisations, and to be honest, I was part of one uh, that were independent, and then all of a sudden, start to apply for money and become an arm's length body. Um, but no, I think that, that helps quite a bit. I, I would be minded that the, I do believe that the department should approve a code, but the, the representation has to be wider, depending on the outcome of this legislation. Of course, if there are any new licenses or amendments that bring people into the licensed arena, um, yeah, it would need to maybe expand itself a little bit more. But thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, any other members then want to make any comment on uh, clauses 19 and 32 before we move on? No? Okay. All right, then members, we'll move on then to clause 20, which is body corporate and change of directors. Um, Carol, again, if I can ask you to give us a, an overview on this. I'm not sure. So clause 20 requires any bar... <laughs> body, sorry, body corporate license holder, um, that they notify uh, the courts and the police of any change of directorship within 28 days. So currently there's there's no such requirement and they can change directors potentially just prior to the renewal of their license and then change back. So that is an issue that the, the police have raised. Yeah, I just I was going to bring that up. So it, it, it is that the, the police have to be informed also because they had concerns um, around um, persons with criminal convictions, so that 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 concern is alleviated now. Yes, Carol. Yeah, it really brings it into line with what would happen um, if you were a, a single person license holder, where if that is being if that license is being transferred, you have to go through a court process to have it transferred. Um, the body corporate, you can just change the directors. N nobody's the wiser. Yeah, I know. I know. I've had issues around this as well, um, where uh, you've had people who have been quite irresponsible, it's happened in my own constituency as well, and uh, has ended up that it has moved round, that the licence has moved round everybody um, because of, of uh, complaints from councils, complaints from residents that ended up in, in court. Um, so uh, does that help with that issue where uh, they, they can freely pass on the licence to another yeah, director? That, that no, that would stop that. So, if there's any if there's any change of director at all, um, I don't know if there's a limit on the number of directors that you could have within a body corporate. But if there's any change of any directors, then that has to be notified to the police and the court, and then it gives the police an opportunity to then um, go and possibly have that license suspended if they have concerns over um, the the um, the appropriateness or the fitness of, of of one of those directors. Yeah, because I know an example that I'm familiar with, it went from a husband to a wife um, because of the, the amount of complaints. And then I think it went to a cousin. And so they kept it all within the family, the license, but just kept swapping it around the place to try and beat the system. Um, so no, that's fair enough. Another issue, as you know, was raised with us from the British Beer and Pub Association, that they felt that the level of fine proposed was disproportionate um, uh, to the failure to notify. Any comment on that, Carol or Liam? 
we would take advice on that and be, the, the decision on the, the level of fine there is in line with um, companies legislation and um, so it's the same level of fine that a company director would have if um if, if there was if there wasn't notification of that change of directorship that's fair enough um any members want to make a comment on clause 20 Car uh, kelly sorry go ahead Thank you, Chair. I seem to be coming in on every one of these, but I'm just so excited to be going through this legislation. Uh, so sorry for all the questions, guys. I know that I had a concern about the Phoenix type companies where they sort of rise from the ashes, you know, if somebody else is in trouble, so they pass it around family members or other people that they know. Um, one of the issues that had come up um, in particular regard to um, younger people was whether or not company directors should be, should be subject to an Access NI type check. Um, I actually spoke to Access NI at one stage in my life. I was actually an umbre a part of an umbrella body who processed Access NI checks. Um, there is an option there for that type of um, check, a basic check to be done on directors to ensure that there isn't anything outstanding um, with regards to um, prosecution or, or conviction, sorry, conviction more than prosecution, um, relating to children. Um, so I just wondered if the department had considered anything further other than just notification of a change of directors, if there'd be any requirement for a director of a licensed premises um, of a body corporate to be required or, or to add to that something like a basic access NI check? Well, I don't think it's anything. Sorry, sorry, Liam, go ahead. No, no, um, Chair, we, we, we hadn't considered that. I mean, and if the police have any concerns, I mean, they have ways of checking uh, criminal convictions uh, already. So the fact that you're notifying it to the police, I think, takes care of that particular concern. Okay, 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 okay. I know that I say SNI, of course, they've said that they would be able and available um, if required, but I just wondered, because of the extension of, of you know, younger people's functions and so on was that something but as you say if the police are able to do that they're able to do that check anyway of course they are um, yeah. it wouldn't be necessarily a requirement just for change of directors for an body corporate okay thank you all right any other member any comment they want to make in clause 20 no okay we'll move on then to clause 21 which is the removal of exemption for Angostura bidders. Um, I don't imagine this will be a very lengthy one to talk about. Carl, if you want to go ahead. Major issue, the removal of exemption for Angostura bidders. Um, so yes, following the removal of, there was a, a duty exemption there. So following that removal um, by HMRC, uh, Angostura bidders are now included in the definition of intoxicating liquor. So practically what that means is where currently they could be sold in an ordinary grocery part of a supermarket, they now have to be sold within the licensed premises part. No, that's that's grand. I only know that they, they go well with some very good gin cocktails. So that's all I know about Angostura bidders. Um, but we there, there was very limited comment on that at all during any of our, our uh, evidence sessions. So I have nothing further to add there. Members, anything they want to ask or add on clause 21? No, I wouldn't imagine so. Nope. Okay. All right, then we'll move on then. So we're coming then to our third set of clauses. Um, so the third set of clauses will uh, we're consider those related to advertising and loyalty schemes. Um, that is clause 16, 17 and 31. You'll find this at document three, which in your pack starts at 653. Um, so we're going to then go firstly to clause 16, which is restrictions on off sales, drinks, promotions in supermarkets, etc. So again, um, Carl, I'll hand over to you. Right, so clause this clause, um, it means that advertisements or drinks promotions um, in a supermarket have to be restricted to the alcohol display area. So the bit in, but you know that you have to actually go through the, the little gates. Um, off sales premises um, won't be permitted to advertise or drinks promotions within two hundred meters of any off sales premises. Um, so that's supermarkets or um, standalone off licenses. Um, and the clause also allows that distance of 200 metres to be amended in the future by regulations if there's a need. Okay, thanks, Carol. Um, okay, there was some talk around this and there was um, a few points were made up. Uh, uh, or a few points were made up. A few points were made. Um, so uh, certainly 
from public health interests, it was fairly widespread support for these proposals to reduce the normalisation of alcohol and impulse purchases, but there was also a view from a number of such submissions that it would only have a minimal impact on reducing alcohol consumption and preventing alcohol-related harm, and that proposed restrictions on off-sales drink promotions do not go far enough with suggestions for restrictions on multi-buy offers. Um, the Public Health Alcohol Act in the Republic of Ireland was highlighted to us with alcohol advertising in or on public service vehicles at public transport stops or stations and within 200 metres of a school, a creche or a local authority playground being prohibited. Also raised was um, whether the proposal to restrict external advertising to within 200 metres of the premises could be enforced. The wider industry and retail sector raised then a number of specific concerns in relation to the proposals. So further clarity is required on the specifics of this clause and the definition of what constitutes an off-sales drinks promotion. Does the clause cover other branded products? The offence provision is too specific and could potentially create friction between competitors. Issues for small and convenience retailers with very limited space in store to promote, place and advertise the products they sell. And then does this clause cover advertising in other parts of their store, things like meal deals, where they sell or promote a particular bottle of wine? And does the clause also extend to cover mass marketing via leaflet communications delivered directly to your homes? Um, so it's just, I suppose, on those points that I had uh, said there at the end of my comments. Liam or Carl, any uh, clarification you want to give on any of those points? I'm going to yes, pick up some of it, Chair, and then have... Carol can, can, can carry on. Uh, I mean, th this is a very important part of the bill. Um, th this, this part really reflects the, the balance towards public health um, and the, the difficulty in dealing with the liquor license and legislation is always trying to get a balance between protecting the public from what can be a very harmful uh, product and at the same time allowing people to socialise and have a, a good night out in a safe environment. But uh, uh, this part is important because uh, if you're going to try and reduce the amount of alcohol uh, being consumed within society, and we know that Northern Ireland has a serious problem with overconsumption, in fact, I've seen recent figures uh, that for, for 2019, uh, the figures were just released by NISRA a, a couple of weeks back, and there was something like 336 people died during that year directly from misuse of alcohol. So uh, it's a dangerous substance. It needs to be controlled. And if you're going to try and reduce um, the amount of alcohol being consumed in society, you need to, uh, to address it to uh, the, the, the place where most of the drink is being sold. So most drink, something like 75% of the drink is now being sold from uh, supermarkets and off licences for consumption at home. And the measures that we're taking here, they are, uh, they're not going to solve the problem by any means, but they are a step forward and that's why they've been welcomed by the health lobby. Um, and for the supermarkets to complain about some minor aspects of this, uh, uh, given the amount of uh, money they make from selling uh, alcohol, uh, I think it's, it's disingenuous. Um, the restrictions will not prevent them from selling drink. All it does is try and uh, curtail uh, spontaneous sales where you're bombarded with uh, adverts for different products as you walk in through the door. If you want to buy drink, you can still go into the licensed area and, and buy whatever drink you wish. Uh, the issue about the Public Health Act in the South uh, and restricting advertising on public service vehicles and close to schools, um, that, that, that is a, a public health issue. Uh, this, this bill is about um, uh, uh, or, or organising the sale of alcohol in licensed premises and associated with licensed premises. So uh, a wider uh, public health approach uh, would be a matter for the Department for Health really um, and it would be outside the scope of this bill to impose restrictions on buses or, or at schools. Um, the meal deals are specifically excluded uh, from the prohibition on advertising so that, that has been taken care of. And uh, I think the minister at the time didn't wish to curtail that activity because ha having uh, a drink along with a meal is probably the safest uh, way of, of consuming alcohol. Okay, well, no, that's good to know because the, the, the uh, issue around meal deals, which is in nearly all of our major supermarkets, um, was raised as an issue, so that's good to know that too. Um, I suppose there, there, I, I understand what you say that there does need to be a public health campaign, um, and that needs to be led by the Department for Health. 
Um, but I suppose where we've got, and I, I can think of one actually near where I live, where there is a bus stop right outside the off sales, um, which uh, would be more than uh, you will see advertisements for alcohol right outside the off sales, which actually flies in the face of the off sales aren't allowed to advertise outside their door, but TransLink, or sorry, um, uh, Northern Ireland Transport can. Um, so that's just a bit of a, an anomaly, I suppose, there. So I suppose maybe conversations with um, the Department for Infrastructure um, around this issue maybe wouldn't be a bad thing. So it wouldn't. And then also that point then about the mass marketing of leaflets and communications. I mean, I know of one retailer, certainly, that you will see um, them advertising their various wines that we get through our doors. Is there anything can be done on that or will this cover that? It won't cover it, no. Um, the, the the legislation can only relate to licensed premises. That's as far as the, the department's remit goes, and um, which is why we can look at sort of a two hundred meter boundary there. Um, you know, so any of the marketing that happens within that area, it would be within the scope of the bill. Anything that happens outside of that area wouldn't be. So the likes then, if you did have a bus stop outside within two hundred meters of a um, uh, uh, an off sales. Would that fall under this legislation? No, that wouldn't be captured. I mean, the, cl the, clause, the clause itself relates to, and uh, that's where the definition comes in of an off-sales drink, drinks promotion. It's promoting the sale of the, the alcoholic drink specifically from that licensed premises. So any advertisement outside would be generic manufacturer's advertising, I believe you're referring to there. Yeah. So it wouldn't, again, we wouldn't, that, that wouldn't come under the scope of this legislation. Okay, no, it's just asking for clarity on it. Um, any member want to pick up on any of those points or anything further on that? On clause 16? No? No, we're all right there? Okay. So I, so I, so I Chair, ahead. just, just on the extension on, on the point that you'd made about the flyer, your brochures that go out detailing offers and that. So is it the case that they wouldn't be able to be distributed to uh, homes? within 200 metres of a licensed premises, but they could be distributed to homes beyond that? I don't think so. I think once you're going into somebody's personal property, that's a different matter, Liam. I don't recall us looking at that, but you might have more no, uh, no that's, that's an unusual one, but um, the, the, the promotion and advertising have to be related to the specific uh, premises. So um, the, and the advertising, rather than putting an, an envelope through somebody's door, it, it's more about you know um, posters and a boards and, and things of that nature uh, that actually be captured. But that's an interesting point, and we need to take uh, legal advice on that one, um, Mark. Okay, cheers, Liam. Thanks, Mark. Robin, you want to come? Sure. Uh, just to pick up on Mark's uh, on a wee bit uh, further. I mean, obviously, an off license or one of the major companies can advertise their products within, say for instance, you buying a newspaper. That newspaper retailer can be right beside the uh, off license and indeed that uh, could quite easily be delivered to folk within 200 metres of a, a, a free newspaper delivered out there will be delivered within free. So it's maybe just within the same point that Mark was making, but it becomes extremely complex to try to to address that issue, I imagine. But I'll take expert advice on that. Um, again, Liam, that's kind of the same thing. On, on that particular point, you know, uh, adverts or, or, or uh, in newspapers or magazines, uh, even those which are on sale within the supermarket, are, are excluded. Well, we okay. <laughs> all right. That's that answered. Um, all right, members. Anything further? I'll ask again on clause sixteen that any member wants to uh, just some clarification on or anything else. No. All right then. We'll move then on to clause seventeen, which is the prohibition of loyalty schemes. And again, Carl, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, so for 17, um, that clause, it's another self-explanatory one. It's basically saying that loyalty points can't be awarded or redeemed um, whenever it's for the purchase of alcoholic drinks. Okay, thanks, Carl. 
All right, I'm just going to read out then the, the list of issues and then I'll ask you and Liam to come back and, and comment on any of these. So the list of issues we had were concerns that this, was, uh, that this unduly penalises responsible drinkers and uh, Northern Ireland consumers. And the NI Retail Consortium proposed an amendment to ensure that supermarkets and retailers as a category of licensed premises are exempted from this. Uh, responsible promotions and marketing practices, including loyalty schemes, are seen by retailers as a legitimate way of maintaining and developing business, uh, and that licensed premises should be allowed to include alcohol sales in loyalty schemes, provided there is no time limit with regard to the redemption. And then applying restrictions on loyalty points for the purchase of alcohol would limit um, the practicality of loyalty schemes and then also that this clause would present operational challenges for multiple retailers um, and create inconsistency for those with stores across the devolved nations and then retailers loyalty schemes often in, uh, involve contributions to charities and their benefits um, should not be overlooked and then finally concerns if the clause would prevent the availability for real ale discount scheme or any other membership benefits or voucher scheme that is operated by responsible licensees. So there was there was a lot of discussion around this, especially in relation to maybe those larger premises and supermarkets. Are we going? Are they going to have a very have to have a different system for Northern Ireland to the rest of, of the United Kingdom and the Republic? And um, just that the, the, they they feel that that could be quite problematic. So. Um, Liam or Carol, anything on any of those points would greatly help. Uh, just uh, first of all, to pick up the last point, uh, Chair, um, these, uh, this scheme operates in, in the South, in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, they have a prohibition on uh, collection loyalty uh, points from loyalty schemes for the sales of alcohol. Um, there's already in place prohibitions on uh, tobacco and, and scratch cards, for example. And I understand that some of the supermarkets already do not permit uh, the accumulation of points for the purchase of, of alcoholic drinks. So, uh, I mean, again, this is about balance. We, know, uh, we don't want to be encouraging people to uh, spend more money to accumulate points uh, by buying drink. Similarly, with tobacco and, and scratch cards. Um, I mean, alcohol is a controlled substance because it, it can be harmful. And this is reinforcing that health uh, protection message. No, absolutely. No, that, that clears up. I had actually forgotten that, that you, you can't uh, gain points um, if, you're, if you're buying tobacco or uh, indeed the lottery and things like that. There are things that are already excluded um, in, in some of our larger supermarkets. Um, any members want to come in for any further clarification or comment on um, that clause? Kelly, go ahead. I just wondered what um, discussions the department did have, as the chair had mentioned, with the, the, the you know, those larger, I'm thinking of supermarkets in particular, or, you know, where people can buy uh, things online. There, there isn't a separate Northern Ireland um, website that we use. Um, I'm just wondering what the discussions have been, how easy it will be for those loyalty schemes to have a different approach in Northern Ireland. Um, I've had some discussion with, with them, uh, with some of the large supermarkets, and they, they will have to amend their systems. And the main concern that they had was that they would have sufficient time to amend their systems. Um, the supermarkets already have to take account of uh, different legislation in Scotland and Wales regarding uh, minimum unit pricing, for example. So uh, they are familiar with the uh, the devolution settlement whereby local assemblies and parliaments are entitled to make their own laws and if they wish to uh, operate in those jurisdictions they have to comply with the law. So I think the, the solution is to give them sufficient time um, and probably tie the uh, commencement of uh, this uh, particular clause should it be passed by the assembly, uh, to tie the commencement to one of the common commencement dates where supermarkets would normally uh, have to comply with tax laws and national insurance and other other changes that all occur around April and October each year. Okay, um, just from a consumer perspective, um, any discussions with um, consumer representative bodies about the variation then across the developed nations? Um, as you've said already, Scotland and other places obviously have the minimum price alcohol, so there is a difference anyway, but I'm just wondering, was there any consumer 
discussions, um, you know, that variation being made? I honestly can't remember, um, Chair. Um, I'll have to go back and, and have a look uh, and see if, if there were. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly not aware, sorry. That's okay. That's okay. No, it's just we're, we're, we're trying to consider everything, you know. So if, if someone comes back to us and says, actually, do you know what? We're really not happy with this, you know, we've, we've given the consideration there. Thank you. And I suppose just to follow up on Kelly's point, as you had said, Liam, the Republic of Ireland already do this, and we know we've got the likes of we have Marks and Spencer's food halls down there, we have Tesco's um, and various supermarkets. So those supermarkets have already um, uh, changed uh, in the loyalty points and how they gather them in the Republic of Ireland. So I don't imagine it would be too much of a change to have to do that for Northern Ireland, I suppose. Yeah, I think, I think you're right, Chair. And just sort of picking up on, on Kelly's point, I suppose, around consultation with consumers, uh, I mean, the, the, all the consumers had the opportunity to respond to the committee's call for evidence and, and to make their points there. And I think quite a lot of, of uh, stakeholders did respond on this particular uh, clause. Okay. Any other member want to raise any issue on clause 17? Chair, and I can just come on. It's, it's not an issue. Just to um, agree and reiterate uh, what what Liam has said there. You know, um, particularly around it's already in place for tobacco and, and lottery. I think when we had a briefing, and I can't remember now the name of the group. I'm terrible with names, but when when they were highlighting, you know, the benefits that for community groups and charities. I don't know of any here that benefit from it. And when I asked the question, he wasn't able to say it either. So, um, I just to say that. You know, I agree with all the points made by Liam there. No, that's fair enough. Thank you. Karen, um, any other comments anybody needs to make or any? Nope. Are we all right? So move on. Yep. Okay. Well, then move on um, to clause 31, which is, again, this is different. This is re restrictions relating to advertisements for registered clubs. Um, again, then, Carl, over to you. Sure. So this clause, Chair, um, Registered clubs will now be allowed to advertise their functions outside of the club premises. Um, that's currently not allowed, but the new, the new, the new permission will be provided on the basis that the advertisement has to clearly state that it's only members and their guests allowed. Now there are circumstances where there's functions where the proceeds um, are fully donated to charitable or benevolent purposes, and for those cases, um, members of the public can attend those events. So this, uh, the, they'll not be required to, to, to obviously make that statement in terms of members and guests on on that advertisement. Okay, no, that's fair enough. And I kind of have answered some of the, the questions that were highlighted. Um, hospitality Ulster supported it, um, provided that the adverts, you know, were strictly members only. Um, though I do understand when it comes to charity events, that's, that's entirely different because those events are very much aimed at, the, at their own communities and charities within their own communities. So you want the entire community to be able to attend that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think I have too much more to say on that. Um, you know, the, let me see what else was said on that. No, I'm fine with that. Um, anybody, any members? Kelly, you want to bring up some stuff? Just something. This might be a bit of a curve, but, but what happens if the club itself is also a registered charity? <coughs> Did you hear that properly, Liam and Carla? No, broke up a bit there. Sorry, no, I couldn't. Couldn't hear that, chair. Go ahead, say it again, Kelly. Sorry, I was. I was just asking, what happens if the club itself is a registered charity? So, you know, you say that um, for charitable purposes, you know, if they're the the fundraising evening that the general public could be admitted but what happens if the club itself is a registered charity you, you will, you'll find that the the club itself will be registered uh, separately usually from from the parent body which could be a charity a sports body um, or, or a sporting club um, but the um, the event itself would have to be for charitable purposes, with the uh, proceeds from that event going to uh, a charity, uh, and that may be their own charity. Yeah, so that's, that's that wouldn't be a problem. Okay. Okay. That's grand. 
I suppose just uh, I'll bring up just a, uh, just a couple of points here as well. Um, you'll know that NI Hotels Federation, um, th their concerns around the clause uh, opening up clubs as functions and event spaces, as the majority of clubs do not pay rates nor are they subject to the same fixed cost base as other licensed commercial venues, and the membership rule has been navigated around successfully in the past. Um, with a small fee, reduced membership period, or an introduction of an associate or a new category. So, just uh, I suppose then the, the the likes of hotels are just a little bit concerned that it will take some of their business away from them. Um, I suppose there's nothing. I mean, there's nothing really we can say or do around that. Um, it, it, that's just it may happen or it may not happen. We you know we can't. Yeah. There's no evidence to support that really. I suppose. Yeah, I think that some of it may be a matter of enforcing the current law, uh, Chair, but this particular clause really just modernises uh, and takes account of the fact that not all members of clubs live within a short distance of the club and will be able to visit the premises regularly to see notices of forthcoming events. Uh, it, it takes account of you know, maybe a club that has members all over a particular town or even spread across uh, several times and they'll be able to advertise now on, on social media and, and in the papers to let people know that, um, that the, the, uh, certain events are taking place. I know that's fair enough. Thank you, Liam. Anybody else want to, any comment or anything further on um, Clause 31? No? All right. Okay then. My goodness, we've got much further than I thought we were going to get, so this is good. Um, uh, it's now, what time is that? It's 12 o'clock now. Members, I'm hoping that we can wrap this up at quarter to one to speak to Claire from the Bill Office in a closed session. And also we need to go back to a, an issue that we were discussion, uh, discussing earlier in the meeting. So I'm going to press on then, because um, um, this one might have a bit of um, chat around it. So our fourth set of clauses um, are those related to tourism and visitor experience, uh, so that's clauses 6, 8 and 25. The summary of evidence we have received in these clauses can be found in document 4, starting at page 667. So first of all, we'll go to clauses 6 and 25, which is major events. Um, so then can I just ask Carol if she wants to give us an overview on this clause? Yeah, certainly. So again, yes, so the, the major events clauses apply both to licensed premises and to registered clubs. Um, the clauses add two new articles to each of the license and order and the, the registration of clubs order. It gives the department a power to make an order that designates an event as a major event. Um, in doing so, then the department can specify the permitted hours for that event. So if the requirement is that it needs to maybe be open slightly earlier or close slightly later, I think Liam mentioned earlier on about you know a, an event wrap party um, where the, the current permitted hours just don't fit in with the, um, with the, the feasibility of the event, um, then, then that, that's permissible. The department um, will be required to consult with appropriate persons before making an order. Um, that could be you know, PSNI, local councils, tourism, NI, that sort of thing. Okay, look, thank you for that. Um, again, we heard from a broad range of stakeholders on the, the issue around major events, and it was highlighted to the committee that there's been a number of events in Northern Ireland that have been negatively impacted, and we've talked about some of them here today as well, by the lack of ability to vary licensing hours when the event falls out the scope of the current legislation. Um, I'm going to ask Mark if he wants to come in first on this, because I know he had raised the issue in a previous clause uh, about uh, what constitutes a major event. Mark, are you there with us? I, I'm, no, no, I'm, I'm content. I, I got the answer earlier, and like, uh, apologies again that I didn't wait for this. Oh, but, right. but, but another cross over there thank you okay i mean i have a whole list of if issues that were included as additional information that i have here but i'm going to open it up to members first and see if they have anything that they want to bring up um we did have issues um uh, around local ad local alcohol producers being able to sell their local produce um, like currently they are unable to sell at national local food and drinks events. We have issues, um, consideration be given that other signature events such as those that take place in council boroughs, which I was maybe speaking about earlier, um, where we had to get uh, local license holders um, to come in. Um, would they be able to obtain an occasional license under major events? The likes of the Belfast um, Christmas market, is it seen as a major event? 
I suppose just uh, Liam or Carl, any further information on anything like that? Uh, Chair, just on, on the, the definition of a major event, I mean, what we're talking about really are, are very large events that are major. You know, so you're talking the, the, the Open Golf Championship, which, which came to Port Rush and, and turned out to be hugely successful uh, in 2019. Uh, it may have been more successful if we had had the flexibility around licensing to uh, permit uh, the bars to open slightly earlier on, on the days of, of the event in that area. Uh, you would have had the opportunity for um, the opening as well on the Sunday for the uh, end, of, uh, end of the championship uh, dinner. So all of those uh, issues, uh, well, it really is a very large events which are, uh, are have the potential to raise the profile of Northern Ireland internationally and bring tourism to Northern Ireland. Um, the Giro d'Italia was another one, the MTV Music Awards. Um, they, we deliberately have not defined a major event within the uh, draft bill because we don't know what may come forward in the future. And if this is going to be in primary legislation uh, and we are too tight uh, in our definitions, uh, we don't have the flexibility that this particular clause is attempting to give us. Um, the, uh, the, the potential here is, is, is great, but we just don't know uh, what may come our way in the future. Certainly there is talk that the um, Open Championship may return uh, to Port Rush in, in, in a few years' time, and that would be greatly welcomed. Uh, and that would certainly be the type of event that we would consider to be a major event for designation under uh, this legislation should it pass. Uh, but we don't want to be too definitive. And at the same time, we're, we're not really talking about small uh, local events, um, such as you know, village fates or, 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 or fairs, uh, those sort of events. OK, no, that's fair enough. I just want to then, break because I've, some of the, the, again, go back to the likes of Northern Ireland, and we remember whenever they were in the Euros back in 2016, I think that was, and there were major, and they were major events that were being held all throughout various places throughout the country. And this could be any any sport or, or of any kind. I'm just using this as the example, um, where I know certainly I attended several of those matches viewed on the big screen um, in my own local council area but they just happened to have a bar on site, so they were able to um, provide alcohol for that. We had one at, we had different ones around the Titanic, different various places. So again, I went back to when I spoke about this point earlier, um, if there was that for many people is deemed as a major event, albeit it took place outside Northern Ireland, there were venues set up throughout Northern Ireland to watch this, to view this, and there was alcohol sold at many of those events. Um, so what way would that fall into this category? Well, I mean, the, the clause, um, Chair, if I can just find it here so I can read exactly what it says. I mean, the, 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 um, where the department considers that an event which is to take place in Northern Ireland will attract significant public interest whether throughout Northern Ireland or in a certain uh, area only. It may make an order, a major event order. So it depends on how you, what you consider to be the major event. Is the major event the Euros Championship taking place in France or is it the gathering of people to watch uh, a match on, on a large screen at a particular venue? And it would be for the organisers of that uh, event, which has taken place actually in Northern Ireland, to make the case that it was a major event and that such a designation uh, should be made. So again, I mean, the minister at the time will take account of the views of the police and also uh, the views of the public that's through media or whatever else. These things, these decisions will be made at the time um, and taken into account a range of factors as to how significant the event actually is. So that could be argued then, the likes of all of those events that did take place across Northern Ireland in 2016 could be argued. That could be argued. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. No, just to get a bit of clarity, that was all on that. Um, anybody else? Kelly? <coughs> Kelly, go ahead. Sorry. Can't hear you. Apologies, I was on mute. 
Um, thought I'd go over that. I think after this length of time, it would be over. Um, sorry, I just wanted to ask clarification question. Um, the Law Society had brought it up as had Northern Ireland Hotels Federation. Why would a major event license allow um, the sale of off licenses, off license alcohol? The, the major event, uh, once it's designated a major event, uh, it would allow the uh, occasional license holder who is organising that event to uh, arrange for the sale of uh, uh, drink for, for consumption at home. And really that's to take account of things like uh, at the Open, for example, um, they had commemorative bottles of whiskey uh, on sale to, to commemorate that particular event. Uh, only only available for those who were actually in attendance. So it was a, a premium product um, being sold for consumption at home, and, and that allows this, this to take place. Now, like with any license, uh, the license applicant will have to go to court and make the case as to why they would be uh, looking to sell uh, for consumption at home, uh, and it would be for the magistrate to decide whether that was appropriate or not at the time. But this, this puts it on a legal footing, should the magistrate agree that, that it is. Okay. Um, so for the person to sell their produce, <coughs> they would have to have a licence, sorry. <coughs> so they have to have uh, their own licence to sell alcohol. Well, yeah. any, anybody selling uh, alcohol by, uh, you know, for consumption uh, has to have a licence. Uh, that's, that's the basic principle of the, of the order. Okay. Okay. Um, one of the other things um, that I just wanted to check with you is, if these major events and, and they are, as you say, they're significantly different. It's not just um, in my local area. There would be many different types of community the areas. You know, would come together and have a community festival. It's different to that. But I'm just thinking. We've said earlier when it comes to the entertainment license that if entertainment is to go on longer than the liquor license, late license, um, that liquor stops being sold at 11 o'clock. For these major events, that's different. So entertainment, will that be allowed to go on later? Um, you know, because it's a, it's a different type of event. So can entertainment then and liquor then go on further than the three o'clock or the two o'clock cutoff? Well, I mean, it would depend on the grant of the licence uh, to whoever's organising the event. This, this, is, this is introducing flexibility. And if, if the um, magistrate permits sale of alcohol to two o'clock, uh, then entertainment could carry on to three. So it, it does introduce flexibility, and, and it would depend very much on the type of event. Um, I mean, we're familiar with some events that have taken place over the last maybe 10 years or so, uh, but there's others that we can't really foresee and we're trying to sort of future-proof this legislation so that it's flexible enough uh, to take account of some sort of event that may come here in the future. Grant, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other members want to ask anything further on um, that close? Um, Chair, ju uh, just, just one wee thing, sorry, uh, and it's around the designation of a major event, I think, Lee in there, it says that be in a situation where the minister at the time could make a decision or a designation. Will the legislation be written in such a way that should we not have a minister, that the department can do so? Yeah, that's a good point. That, that's a good point, um, Chair, and I, I'll, I'll have a look into that. I, I think we should be future proofing all legislation, not, not just this, but we don't want to be in a situation that we were. And for three years, but you never know. You never know. Rob, Mark Robin wants to know what do you know that we don't know? <laughs> <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> no, let's not go there. Um, yeah, no, but it is a good point because none of us knows what, what lies ahead. Um, so, yeah, I'll leave that one with you, Liam. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to ask again then is there anything further on clause? Clauses rather six and twenty five. No, nope, happy enough members. Okay, then we'll move on to then. Okay, I've totally lost my place. Where are the folks here? Close it. <coughs> oh, yes, okay, close it. Um, which is license for off sales small producers. 
Um, so I'll ask then, Carl, if you want to go ahead and to talk to this clause. Mm, certainly, Chair. So clause 8, yes, licence for off sale. So it relates to um, local producers of alcoholic drinks, um, so for beer, cider and spirits and um, a new category, this clause will create a new category um, of licence that, um, or a new category of premises, sorry, where uh, can, can apply for a licence. So a local producer's licence will permit three different things. It will allow local producers to sell their own products from their own premises for consumption off the premises, um, and that automatically would include um, online sales. Um, a sample can be provided for consumption on the premises following a tour and the volume of that sample will be set by regulations. The clause also allows local producers to sell their own products from certain licensed premises for consumption off the premises at events such as food and drinks fairs, um, so where the BBC Good Food Show was at, um, uh, you know, the Waterfront Hall for example, um, they, they would be covered there and again samples can be, can be provided there. And finally, it will allow local producers to sell their own products from unlicensed premises for consumption off the premises at such events as food and drink fairs. Um, so if you think of some of the National Trust places that would do maybe um, uh, spring, summer, autumn, winter fairs, Christmas fairs and things like that, um, it could be that there's maybe only one local producer that wants to go there and this will allow them then um, to, to sell their wares there. Um, there's a number of conditions placed on that part of it, um, purely because it relates to unlicensed premises. So there's um, there's different conditions there, um, and these include receiving approvals from from the police um, as to as to whether there should be alcohol at all sold sold at the event. Okay, Carl, thank you. Um, as everybody, including Carl and Liam, know. Um, this was one that has had a lot of debate um, through our evidence gathering and you know there is wide sports support certainly for this new category of license for small producers um, but there's also been um, some added commentary and concerns that have been raised for many of, of these small producers so I'll just go through some of these um, so that there's been no, no provision has been included to allow for consumption on site the ability for local producers to be able to sell um, for consumption on site in the likes of a tap room. The occasional license process is not working for small producers. It is not something that a business could invest on the back of. Mm -hmm. Not all producers will want to create the tap room experience. There is no mechanism within the proposed legislation to provide samples within multi-venue food tours outside of licensed premises that it does not include the flexibility needed to be for any practical use for many producers, particularly so for those in rural locations. The provisions still fall short of what is required to allow small producers to grow and clarification is needed regarding the ability for small local producers to sell online. And I think that you did say there in your, Carol, that, that, that this would allow for them to sell online, but if, you, if there are other issues um, around that. Uh, members, this evidence was balanced um, against that we received from the wider hospitality sector, so I need to make comment on that too. And I said that it's important that any new licence card category does not duplicate the abilities legislated for within existing licensing categories, as this would undermine the current marketplace. Um, Taproom consumption is recreating a pub by another name, and whilst they are in industrial areas now, it would be easy to set up in towns and city centres. Pubs have incredibly high rates and controls placed on them. Craft brewers would uh, then be competing against the people they are trying to sell their product to. And finally, there is a place for occasional tap rooms, and they have operated under occasional licences, partnering up with pubs. Um, we are an industry that will buy most of their products, so partnering with uh, us to do so um, or to do tap rooms in a controlled manner is a much better approach. So that has been the the other side of the argument as well, because we uh, certainly we have to take on both sides of the argument. Um, so can I just then ask uh, Liam and Carl if they want to make any comment on that, especially around the issue of tap rooms? It is something that we have heard. Um, compelling evidence um, that, that, that this is something that is very much needed. Um, so just if you want to make a comment around that. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, and, and this uh, 
for, for a very, very small sector, I suppose, that have generated a, a tremendous amount of publicity around this issue of tap rooms. Um, whenever this legislation uh, was developed earlier this year, it was based very much on the experience of the 2016 committee stage. And at that point, um, what local producers were looking for was the ability to sell for consumption off the premises, um, and, and that was provided for. Um, the, as Carol pointed out as well, this allows online sales, and uh, there's a great opportunity there for local producers to develop their products and sell uh, both here locally and further afield uh, via the internet. Um, we took it further as well to allow um, local producers to use their license to sell on licensed premises such as the Waterfront Hall at the BBC Food and Drink and then uh, at large uh, food or, ag or agricultural shows such as the Balmoral Show. So there's a, a lot in the bill for local producers. Now, the, the, the tap rooms uh, issue has come up, and, and they've been very vocal around the tap rooms issue, although not all local producers would want to go down that road because um, they would see themselves directly competing with, with pubs. So I mean, the, the issue for the department, I suppose, really is around um, the unknown implications of introducing this category where, let's face it, it really will be a, a small pub. Uh, because you will be selling for consumption on the premises. And I think I mentioned earlier on in, in the, our discussions around one of the other clauses, like maybe Clause 1, that the way the licensing order is uh, structured, um, only a pub or an off-sales is permitted to sell alcohol uh, unfettered. Um, the other uh, licensed premises, it's all ancillary to some other type of activity such as you know, you're staying as a guest in a hotel, and you are um, attending a, a sports event, you're attending a race meeting, and all of the other types of categories have something else associated with it. You know, a restaurant, you have to have a meal. So this would be almost like a subcategory of a pub where uh, people could, could only sell and, and consume their own, uh, their, for consumption, their own products. And the difficulty for the department would be that the, there's been no real research or assessment of the impact of introducing this category. You know, how many of these types of mini pubs would emerge? Um, you can imagine that the, the people who are involved in it now uh, are only a small number, but there could be business opportunities for others who would see this as a way of opening a pub uh, almost through the back door uh, with less uh, overheads than the traditional pubs that we have in our town centres. Um, the, the impact assessments haven't been done, there's been no proper consultation and the evidence from the hospitality industry would be that this would cause a problem. So you know, there may well be big benefits in terms of those local people uh, who are producing uh, beers and spirits being able to sell directly, and, and they may benefit. There may even be a tur tourism angle where people will want and go and, and, and to enjoy uh, beer festivals at, at these tap rooms. Um, but none of it's been properly analysed, and there's been no uh, proper assessments done as to the impact. And when you're making law that it's going to have a large impact uh, on, on society, we probably want to make sure that we have a fair idea of what's going to happen. No, look, thank you for that, Liam. And I suppose this is the one that I think will, will be one of the, the, the clauses that will cause the, the committee um, a, a more lengthy deliberation on, a um, more lengthy discussion on beyond this discussion today. Um, because we have heard, we've, we've heard really very strong, compelling evidence for, but we've also heard strong evidence against. Um, so it, it will be a difficult one for the committee to, to, to come to a decision on, I would imagine. Um, because if we do decide that we want to bring an amendment forward, then we need to look at a different set as well of, of, of charges and, and you know, how, did, how does that compare to the, the, the charges that our, our pubs pay for their licences and various things like that. So it will, it will, it will become an, a, larger, um, a larger piece of work um, in front of us. Um, so I'm just going to open up to members and ask members if they um, want to um, ask some further um, questions. Kelly. Um, interesting point that there has been no research done on the impact. Um, why wasn't there? Um, because I would have thought, given the amount of 
contact that, that certainly the committee has had from various people on this, the department must have come across this whenever you were drawn together the legislation. I'm just wondering why um, the department chose not to. Uh, it isn't. It isn't the department's proposal, Chair. Um, this is a proposal that's come forward during this committee stage. Um, whenever we drew up the proposals originally, they were based on the debates in 2016, where tap rooms weren't mentioned. I'm a bit surprised at that because some of the evidence that we've received would have said that the, the guys had been in contact at that stage. Um, the consumption on premises there's been there has been a number of of concerns raised and and we were listening open minded to everyone's concerns and uh, one of the things that you said there was about um these potential tap rooms setting up um in other places the thing is these are these are breweries you know you can't just set up somewhere there's other legislation that attaches to them with health and safety and so on so I, i'm a bit confused if there's been no research done why why do people assume that that can happen I, I just don't get it. Well, I mean, there's, there's breweries based in, in town and city centres all over. I mean, why would they not be able to set up in a, in a city centre? I mean, yeah, they that's the door room why, right in the middle of Dublin. Yeah, that's the point. Why wouldn't they be able to set up? But it would be actually a brewery. It wouldn't just be a tap room. You know, it has to be attached to yeah. the premises that are making the product. Um, sometimes I just think that, that some of the, the comments around this... Are, I don't know. It's just maybe it's because we don't have that um, that dis that research and discussion that has happened. It is going to cause us quite a bit of difficulties as a, as a a, a committee. Um, I appreciate that there's lots of other um, you know aspects within the bill that that do help um, those local brewers, but um, because we don't have the research, um, the the tourism sector seem to suggest that there would be. A significant increase in tourism expenditure here and Northern Ireland as a destination for food and drink could be expanded more um, rather than selling um, products that are imported to here. We could actually sell products that are from here and I know that they can certainly export now but the growth in that export would be helped if tourists were able to sample, or not more than sample, but purchase from here. Um, the online is very welcome. Um, but it's, it's one of the things, for instance, you'd mentioned earlier about um, if product is being sold and it's in the manufacturer's container. Um, we have been had conversations about blended, collaborated, um, you know, collaboration drinks. Has there been any thought within the department, probably not actually, um, about that type of collaboration um, working together? Is, it, is there any rules about... You know, is it is it considered a collaboration if it's somebody else's beer but it's bottled somewhere else? The the, the, um, the beer has to be produced by the producer to sell from their premises. I mean, collaboration is a very loose term and would be very difficult to define legally. And um, if you have two brewers uh, in their their uh, in a bar having a chat about how uh, to produce beer, and one says, uh, "I like this particular ale you produce," but if you add an extra product such as some cinnamon it'll be it'll be delightful uh, is that a collaboration if he goes off and produces it with a bit, a bit of cinnamon uh, it's very very hard to define uh, legally so what the the clause says at the minute is it'll have to be uh, produced on the premises and uh, go back to the bit about tourism uh, uh, and uh, i think tourism uh, and food and i are correct that this is uh, a, a new industry and it may well uh, encourage tourists to maybe to visit uh, cider producers in County Armagh during the uh, apple, apple blossom season and things like that. Um, and, but if, if this legislation passes, people will be able to buy, will be able to have a sample after a tour of the cider producer, producer's premises and, and take bottles away with them. They'll also be able to drink the, the products in, in, in local bars um, as we can now. Um, although I, I take on board the concerns that the producers have, have stated during their evidence that it can be difficult for them to get uh, all of their products uh, into local bars, and that comes down to commercial decisions. You know, by bars that difficult to take up space on on a bar with a product that may not sell that that many. So, there, I mean, the, the, the lack of research and the lack of impact assessments uh, really 
find, you find it very difficult to come to a, a conclusion. You know, there, there's the possibility that this could be very good. There is also the possibility that it would have you know, little or no impact. But there's also, uh, uh, on the other hand, it, it could cause damage to uh, a, a large industry and you know that employs a lot of people and generates a lot of uh, money for the economy already. We just don't know. I think I think at it from a consumer's point of view where competition is healthy. Um, but the other thing I wanted to ask you was if, if and it's all if, I know it's supposition, um, if there was a license for a local producer to sell their own product on site for consumption, um, obviously we, 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 we appreciate completely the pubs and, and hotels and, and the work that they have where they can sell a range of whatever drinks that they choose to sell. Um, but if, if there was limitations on this license, is that able to happen? I'm just checking to make sure that we don't, if there was a license produced for local producers, it can be legislated for that, say, for instance, it would be certain days of the week or certain times of the day that would be different to pubs and hotels and what they can do. For instance, the the extended hours may not apply to a tap room. Um, you know, I'm just thinking, is it legally okay <clears throat> within the department's consideration for a variation on a license um, to happen? Yes, well, um, uh, any new category of license uh, would have to have um, permitted hours associated with it, and that would be a matter for the assembly to decide, um, you know, when and how uh, uh, a license of this type would operate. Um, so yes, uh, I mean I, I don't foresee any huge legal obstacles to it. It's, it's all really about the the impact uh, that uh, introducing that category of license will have. And and like um, earlier when we were talking about the codes of practice, um, obviously we have codes of practice that doesn't con- contain tap rooms at the moment because they're not here. Um, would it be? I'm just trying to think sort of outside the box here, if there was a license for a local producer where they could sell for consumption on premises, would they need to be brought into, would the department be minded that it's one code of product that covers everything to do with alcohol sale? Or would it be that local producers would have their own code of conduct? Or how, what would you think about that? It's, it's all very, very difficult, uh, Kelly, given that we're talking about hypotheticals. But I, I would imagine that the easiest way to operate is to have one code of practice uh, that covers the retail sale of alcohol. Because the things that we're talking about by way of that code is about principles, about not encouraging people to drink too much, not encouraging people to drink too fast, not advertising in a way that in, in encourages young people to consume too much alcohol. Um, so th- th- there are broad principles that should apply really to anybody involved in the retail sale of alcohol. Yeah. No, that's grand. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Okay, it's, uh, are we any other member that wants to uh, come in on Clause 8? No? Uh, sorry, Chair. Okay. Uh, this is one we, we, we have uh, devoted a lot of time to over the past uh, couple of months, and it was always going to come to some sort of, or always is going to come to some sort of uh, crunch point. I, I think the sector, the local brewers have brought forward a very strong case and that has been bolstered, I suppose, by the evidence or opinions we've heard from the, the likes of the, the tourist board and others who see the value that this new type of licence could add uh, to our tourism product. Now, my fear would be that in the absence of work being done by the department, and I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not having a go at these laymen, I don't underestimate the amount of work that you guys have been doing on this for, for a long time now, but the concern might be that then, you know, an amendment is tabled when this bill comes to the Assembly that doesn't, uh, I suppose, legislate for or, or, or take into account or say anything about any restrictions on a licence like this or variations from a pub licence like K- K- Kelly alluded to there and given I suppose that, that, that there has been very effective lobby in my opinion from the sector there's nothing to say that and I'm not looking for you to make our job easier per se uh, Liam and Carl but it should an amendment be put forward that the, the political support might be there for it and uh, and approve it, and it could just create an absolute nightmare uh, for the department and difficulty for existing uh, pub owner and licensees as well as as they've articulated. So I think maybe 
point the department might need to start looking at it and I have to say like Kelly I can understand the bulk of the work having been done for the previous bill in 2016 but we've been discussing this for a number of months now and this particular item has probably been discussed more than any other so I don't know has, has any kind of background work or, or, or anything started in that space name looking at how a license that would permit on sales that local producers might look or, or what restrictions might or could be applied to it um, no, Mark. As I explained to Kelly, um, this is this is not a proposal coming from the department, um, and my minister, I know, would be concerned about um, kicking this can down the road and delaying this bill because she believes that the, this bill is badly needed, and um, particularly with the impact on the hospitality industry recently around the, the whole uh, 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 pandemic. So to um, start off a, a bit of research into this, it's not something that's going to be done in, in a, a few weeks. Uh, it's going to need a, a serious uh, investigation as to how these tap rooms operate in other jurisdictions, what the economic impact has been, and how they would operate within the licensing regime in Northern Ireland, which is very, very different to what you would have in jurisdictions which were mentioned by the producers, such as Australia, um, you know the the the, the, uh, the economic situation would it be to be taken into account? Uh, the type of premises that might be licensed. Um, you know you're talking then as well about issues around planning permission, um, uh, fire certificates, uh, numbers of pre people who'd be permitted on the premises, um, and how suitable particular premises are for consumption. You know do they have uh, sufficient toilets? Do they have uh, um, fire escapes to the have there's, there's a huge raft of issues that need to be looked at. Yeah, but the, the difficulty I'm maybe foreseeing is that an amendment will be brought by someone or, or a party or, or, or more than one party, perhaps that, that you know might might call for this sort of special license. It might be carried by the assembly, and then you're going to have to do all that work anyway. And then the effect or impact on existing pubs would actually be, be worse. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Um, whenever the Assembly are debating these issues, the, the members will be taking into account uh, the evidence and, and they, they will make a decision as to how they wish to proceed. Uh, whenever it was into law, um, I mean, that, that, that's, that's what we deal with. And, and the uh, civil servants will, will apply the law and, and implement it in, in line with the instructions from their minister. Uh, it'll be, it'll be, it should, should an amendment of this nature come forward, uh, we, we would find out in due course what the impact is. Uh, but to date, we don't really know. It would be a, a leap of faith, really, you know, to go into the, go, go forward with uh, a particular proposal without really understanding what's going to happen. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, but, well, I, ha I have already declared an interest, but but the last thing that, that we do want to do is, uh, you know, punish the the, the sector that, that has been like crucified over the past year and it's had, uh, had a rough time for a number of years before that uh, as well. But, but I mean, there are opportunities here as well for for growth. But uh, thank you. Okay, thanks, Mark. And I think Mark is absolutely right. I don't think you, you, any of us require a crystal ball um, to think that there will not be some sort of amendment brought forward in this, whether that is a committee amendment, whether that's an individual or a party. Um, so I think that the, certainly there needs to be preparations made for the, this amendment will certainly, I would imagine. Um, as I say, I, I don't think any of us need a crystal ball to say that this is going to happen. Um, so, yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, Kelly, you want to come back? Chair, I'm just, um, I'm just wondering, um, the department has been listening into our sessions um, since we have been discussing um, all of this. And well, as a committee, we have received an extraordinary amount of information. Um, I'm, I'm just checking the department has access to that information. Um, I appreciate that everybody's under a considerable amount of pressure and stress, but in the last number of months, we've been able to get 
um, a considerable amount of evidence together. Um, I'm just wondering if the department would perhaps like to have a look at that. Um, I know that there have been other clauses that have been indicated today that the department are minded to consider amendments. You know, if, if the committee wants to bring something forward, I'm just quite surprised given the amount of meetings that we have had and discussions that there have been that the, the, the department hasn't thought that there would be an amendment coming forward on this. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not going to prejudge. We may not have an amendment, but I think um, given the, the, the cross-party support on this, I would be surprised if there wasn't. I, I suppose, um, just to, to say, and Liam will maybe want to come in on this, um, the department absolutely will have been listening to all of ours, and uh, there has been work with the, our, um, our own committee clerk, with Janice and the department, back and forward on yeah. all of the issues. Um, though I do know that if it, if it was the department would need to do their own uh, investigations rather than just the committee. Um, on, on, I mean, there, there's unintended consequences that we maybe haven't thought about, that maybe haven't come up in, in our debates and deliberations. So um, I don't know, Liam, you want to comment any further? Yeah, no, um, I mean, the, the points that Kelly made are, are, are well made. I mean, the department has been listening in, and, and any amendment that comes forward, the minister will consider at the time. And uh, the difficulty with the evidence being brought to the committee, though, is that uh, it's been brought forward by stakeholders who have a vested interest in presenting uh, their case in a particular way, either for or against. And um, so, you know, the hospitality industry, uh, hospitality Ulster, for example, say that this will cause serious damage to the hospitality industry. It will cost jobs and it will cost businesses to close. The, the brewers who come up, and, and we had quite a lot of them come up, they all made the point that this would be very, very good for, for their businesses to be able to expand and sell uh, further afield. Now, the detailed work that the department would need, and it would probably entail um, bringing in outside consultants to actually look at the economic and social impact of, of these uh, tap rooms, how many of them would eventually emerge, what economic impact would they have if they were established close to or next door to uh, another pub, uh, what are the social impacts, because you, you heard evidence from Stirling University around the uh, when you increase the number of outlets for sale of alcohol, uh, alcohol consumption goes up. Uh, we know that the the local brewers' beer products are much stronger than the uh, the big companies that sell through pubs. So, is there an impact on health? You know, these are all the sort of detailed issues that we want, and we want them to be done independently. Uh, and while the evidence produced uh, by the local producers has, has been has been very very interesting and, and very useful, uh, as has the evidence from uh, hospitality officer and others who would be opposed to this approach. And we, we need to take an independent view, and it probably would require uh, a, a consultant to get in, uh, look at, at the impact in other areas, and try and bring that to Northern Ireland to see what the potential the pros and cons are. Uh, and that's all I'm saying. I mean, I, I didn't say for a minute that our minister wouldn't consider an, an amendment. She may well uh, wish to go down that road, depending on, on how the committee uh, structure it, or, or whichever member brings forward the, the, the committee, or brings forward the amendment. Uh, um, but there are a lot of issues to be taken into account. It, it's, it's not just a win-win. Okay. Um, I know, Alex, you had been waving, and Robin also wants to make a, a point. Alex, go ahead. Yeah. Um, it's not really a question. It's, it's just just a, a view of mine. And, you know, I think that w there was a good argument and a compelling argument that was made about this, and I'm... I'm Disappointed that it's not there really, and you know I would have to seriously consider the member or myself does put a something down on this. Um, I, I just think it would be unfair for tap rooms to be left out, um, and it, it's something I think the committee really needs to look at. Um, because if it gets left out of this, it's not going to be in it for years. Um, and I, I just think there's a compelling argument, and that's that's just my opinion at the moment. I'm a bit disappointed that uh, it's all getting left out at the moment. Thank you. Okay, Alex, thank you for that. Uh, Robin? Thank you, Chair. I, I do uh, agree that uh, the presentations on, on the matter around top rooms were a compelling 
uh, uh, case uh, and indeed the hospitality and tourism uh, aspects uh, which in general seem to be um, uh, supportive. Uh, I do, uh, and I do now understand where Liam is coming from, uh, and indeed the Law Society, Northern Ireland Law Society, in their comments uh, indicated that uh, if if widen to top rooms with a subsisting license be agreed uh, is their question, or license in an area need to be have been surrendered to allow a top room. And then, I suppose they, they add and strengthen it by saying, if so, the society views this as a major change to the current law, which does not appear to have been adequately addressed within the current consultative uh, process. And I have to say, Chair, I hadn't picked that up as the evidence sessions were going on until Liam actually raised the issue today. Having said that, there did appear to be a compelling uh, case made by uh, those in support of it. Um, uh, so I don't really understand where Liam's dilemma is on this. Yeah, I think I think I think there's a dilemma for all of us on this because we can see the arguments, um, both for and against, and we knew from you know we knew from very early on in this bill that this would be the one that would have the most debate um, around it. Like members, if your members have had or have asked the department all that they needed to ask them around this, um, could I then just then propose that we finish the licensing bill at this stage? Um, I would imagine that next week we should probably do this with our deliberations. I think the, the, the final set or the fifth set of clauses um, are around children and young people. Um, I think we can get through those next week without any great difficulty. Um, so we, at this stage, are a week ahead, but I, I imagine Tap Rooms is going to take a little bit more discussion for the committee itself. Um, so would members be in agreement then uh, that we, we cease um, the deliberations at this stage? Agreed. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, then can I um, thank um, Liam and Carol um, for their time today, and um, we'll see you again next week. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you. Okay, members, um, as I said to you, we're going to go into closed session um, shortly with Claire from the Bills Office, but I need to bring you back um, to the issue that was brought up earlier, and that was our tabled paper, SL1, the Social Security Claims and Payments Telephone and Video Assessment Regulations. Um, so we, uh, Sean, uh, uh, here in the committee, had been texting the DALO um, on this issue, and the DALO had, had made comment that this needs to be uh, put through this week. Um, they've also said in their correspondence, we have it here in written correspondence, that um, that no one shall be put under pressure to attend via telephone or video as it is an additional option and entirely voluntary, which was the question I think Andy you had asked around that. And then they'd also uh, said in their response that details on v VRS are available on the NI Direct and they've put the link here and it said that these regulations will have no impact on that service. So I assume that VRS is available for that service by that, but I could be wrong. And no, Kelly, you have your hand up. And she said they have also said that please note there is no change in a representative being able to attend alongside a claimant. Um, also, so um, Kelly, did you want to make comment there? I just know that we're <coughs> under pressure that this this has to be uh, done today. I'm content that the the. What is it? The SL one um, goes forward. I I would like the department to come back because I know for a fact that it is not clear to um, people when they're offered the video um, exactly what is open to them. Um, like for instance, putting VRS on NI Direct is all very well and good, but that's a lot of use for somebody who has a learning difficulty and has problems using a computer. Um, and while a lot of people would prefer to have the face to face meeting, um, even if it is via screen, um, it is not clear for people. So the, what the proposals are today, or what the legislation is today, um, fine, a video is a, a generic term that can go forward, but I think the department are being a little bit disingenuous when they're talking about how well people actually know what is on offer for them um, and what is being provided. Um, yeah, so it's it, I'm content for it to go through today, but I think the department has to understand that they're 
use of language in these terms um, leave a lot to be desired because it's not as clear cut as they maybe think the system is. Okay, thank you, Kelly, for that. Andy, did you want to come back and make a comment? Yeah, Chair, just, just uh, I would echo Kelly's comments there, just to make it clear to the Department, and, and I appreciate the reassurance that, that the letters are structured in such a way that it's clear to those individuals that um, the, the telephony or video based assessment is not a requirement and it's, it's an option that's available to them should they wish to proceed but if they don't feel comfortable or able to proceed in that manner that they can wait for a face-to-face -face assessment. Okay, okay, thank you Andy. So then can I then just put it to members, um, are they content that the department for the department to proceed to make this rule? Yes? Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you members for, for that. Um, okay, members, um, now we're going to move into closed session um, to speak with Claire from the Bill Office. So I'd ask us just to stay on the line and I'll finish the, the meeting, the public session at this stage. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.